All right, here we uh, go. Right. Reggie Wright Jr. Oh. Welcome to Vlad TV. Man, it's an honor to be here. Hey, man, thank you so much for coming. You, uh, you're definitely intertwined in a very important story in, in music and, you know, hip hop and death row and everything else like that. Well, thank you. Yeah, well, I appreciate you coming in. Mm -hmm. So let's start in the beginning. Where'd you grow up exactly? Grew up in the city of Compton. Uh, uh, the reason why I'm here is because I'm one that uh, kind of with Suge Knight, uh, me and him were childhood friends. We oh, so you were friends with, with Suge? Yes. As a kid? Did you guys go to high school together? Or? We went to, well, we're, we're, I'm one of the few that can say we all went to the same elementary, same junior high school, and the same high school. Oh, okay. So I went to uh, Stephen C. Foster, which was in Compton. But then we lived on the borderline of Linwood, Compton. And so he and I, our parents decided first, I guess, to go to Hustler Junior High School in Linwood. And then we went on to Linwood High School, which was really closer to us. We were supposed to be going to Dominguez High School in Compton, but we went to Linwood. It was a better football school. And uh, we played high school football together. Okay. And Suge, from what I understand, had a two-parent home, right? He and I both did. Yeah, both you guys did. Yes. And um, he played football in high school. Yes, sir. And did you also or no? I was on the football team as well. Okay. Yes. Who was the better player? <laughs> in high school, I think I was. Okay. But I was a year younger. Okay. I was a year behind you. But Shug became, in, at El Camino, he was the talk of the town at El Camino Community College. And once he went to UNLV, he even uh, took his game to another level. Yeah, and he eventually went pro, right? He went pro. He Unfortunately, he went through that time when they had the scab, when the... Uh, I guess they was on strike, and so most of his professional games was playing during the, uh, the strike or the scab players, but he also got two shots. Most people don't know. They know about the shot with the Rams, but he also got a shot with the 49ers. And, uh, okay. he, he, unfortunately, he got arrested <laughs> on the practice field during uh, uh, one of the games or, or practices, and um, then I think the 49ers gave away with him. One of the teams cut him. I think it was the 49ers cut him after that. He got arrested? Yeah, he for, had an old what? case in Las Vegas where he was being a bouncer because he was a popular guy at UNLV. And um, he got into an altercation working the nightclub as security, and a guy got shot. And um, he got arrested for that case. But he eventually beat that, that case and was just told, get out of Vegas. <laughs> Okay, so he eventually beat it, but I guess they went to go get him. They came uh, to the to to the Forty Niners practice field. It was one of the, don't quote me on it. It was either the Forty Niners or the Rams. I forget okay. which one it was, but, but he he eventually beat that case. Yes. Okay. So during that time, so let me let me think back. Um, you're talking about you guys are growing up in Compton in the early '80s. Yeah, we I graduated from school in high school in 1984. Yeah. Like I said, he was a year older than me. So he graduated in 83. Okay. So we're talking probably 87, mm -hmm. maybe 88. So here you are in Compton, and crack is hitting oh, Compton. Yeah, boy, Ronald Reagan was dropping it off. <laughs> His yeah. people were dropping it off. Right. So, so you're, you're living, because originally Compton was kind of a working class community. Mid-level, um, mid you know, yeah. we, we were, thought we were a little better than Watts, right. a little worse than Carson. <laughs> okay, right, and, and it was kind of mixed at a certain point, right? There was both white and black and so forth. We had pretty much pushed them out in mid-70s. Okay. Uh, my parents, I remember when we bought the home, we bought from people that were white that was probably moving to Cerritos or Bellflower area. Mm -hmm. And um, they, were, they were pretty much leaving. About the time um, uh, I became in high school, I, I didn't have that many white fr friends or students. They all was pretty much... Uh, we were about 85% black, mm -hmm. maybe 15% uh, Mexicans. So here you are living in Compton, and crack gets introduced yes. into the neighborhood. Correct. Along with crack comes all the guns, all the murders, yes. all the violence, and then the gangs start to increase as well. Correct. Now, you're, you're a ground zero of all this. Now, your dad... Is is a uh, was working for Compton PD at that point? He he was okay. And what was his uh, rank at that point? 
He was a, he was the gang investigator for the city of Compton at that time. Uh, they didn't have they weren't big on having like they have all the crash and gang units now. It was a two man unit. <laughs> it was him and uh, another guy that he speaks very highly of. I remember his name was Rick Beckman or Beck or something like that. Uh, they pretty much was the gang intelligence for the city of Compton. They actually didn't even call them gang. I think they called them a graffiti team or something like that. Okay. <laughs> they didn't even come up with the name gang unit yet. So how did you see the community change once the drugs hit? Uh, me, I was fortunate uh, enough to uh, have it from both sides because I was still young. I got hired on for the city police department at the age of 19. Um, right after high school? Right after high school. I went a year. I went to Cal State University, Long Beach. And... Um, Went there, thought I was going to be this big football player and all of that, and they had that changeover in coaches, and the coach that, that had kind of recruited me to go over there, I don't think he was feeling me too much, the new coach, <laughs> and so they wanted me to red shirt, and I, I, I set out, and um, I eventually uh, started working for the, the, in the jail while I was going to school at Long Beach State, and um, went from there. Okay. So, but, so you got to see it from both sides as a, someone who's living in the community as well as someone who's now involved with the police in exactly. the community. That's what I meant. Okay. Yes. How bad was it? It was bad. It was bad. Uh, it was bad as far as the, the street level uh, crack cocaine and the young guys, you know, my age or younger, walking around with two or $3,000 in their pocket at all times, buying the, the Saran Suzuki Jeeps. Or fixing up the nice VW Volkswagens and stuff like that, we went through that era. Now, at that time, during the whole high school era, you know, post high school, was Suge involved in any of the street business at all, or was he just uh, a good kid playing football and so forth? No, Suge, um, like I said, he went on to El Camino College and he went to UNLV, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, and was playing football. I don't think he got introduced into the uh, the street life <laughs> or whatever until you know he went through the, the stint with the football and he got cut and he started working for a pr promoter by the name of Al Heyman. He went a guy named Big West. Big West uh, got him on and they were working for Al Heyman. They were like pretty much Al Heyman right hands, and um, and that's when I think he got introduced to the street life and came back to the neighborhood and started hiring some of the homeboys that grew up with us that we went to elementary school. Uh, like I said, we didn't go to junior high school or high school with them, but we knew them because we you know, was walking the same payment. Okay, and Al Heyman, he was a, he was a boxing promoter? He's a boxing promoter now. Oh. But back then, he was Budweiser's Superfest. He mm. used to give, matter of fact, he's the one that came up, and that's what Shig always laugh about with the Scream Tour. That's when Al B. Shore and Bobby Brown and all of them was real hot. And, and he had them. But prior to that, all our parents, when I'm talking to my parents, my parents is like 70, 65. They used to have this big old concert in San Diego called the Budweiser Superfest. Yeah. And that's where our parents went all the time. And that's what Al, that was an Al Heyman production. Okay. Because Suge, wasn't he uh, ended up being Bobby Brown's bodyguard at one point? That's how all that met from Al Heyman. Uh -huh. He met them doing the screen tour and, and concert and all of that. and. And, and eventually DOC. DOC is the one who really got him and gave him his break yeah. into the game. That's who he really was making his money into was Doc. Yeah, I interviewed uh, DOC. Oh, okay. Yeah, and he basically said how him and Suge, Suge was kind of his friend slash bodyguard, and yeah. they would go to clubs together, and yeah. DOC would get drunk and do some yeah. ignorant, and then Suge would, had to come, maybe, Suge would come and punch the dude in the face, and then they would yeah. get banned out of the club, and yeah. they'd do it over the next night. And Yeah. I would make the mess and he would clean it up. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. When you say make a mess, give me an example. I'm drunk and I'm walking into this club and I slap some guy's girl on her butt. And obviously he's going to not like that, you know. And my response would probably be, probably be something really vulgar and, and childish. And, and, and at that point he would have to make a move, you know. And none of those people probably even saw Shug till it was too late. So it was too yeah. late. And then, and then his people and our people, it would be a big mashup. 
and and then we all be running away from the club like like kids, which we were basically. You know? Okay, that's unfortunately, you know, that's what people don't know about Shug. Most of the Shug cases and most of the things he got in trouble from was always coming to be this save other guys. <laughs> got in trouble for being the guy to come and be Captain Save a Hove to another man. <laughs> I remember one of, the, one of the stories that DOC told me was, uh, he said this kind of sort of explains Suge's kind of mentality a little bit. He, he was saying how... Suge was a big kid. He's a deviant. You know what I mean? Like, he used to tell stories about pissing on football players' legs in the shower and thought that was just the funniest shit in the world. You know what I mean? I do a, a live stream once a week on this website called Bomb First, mm -hmm. uh, uh, web YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And, it, and I'll be trying to explain to people, everybody thinks Shug's this big bully. Shug's not a bully. Shug thinks he's a comedian. <laughs> that's what it is? funny. <laughs> and, 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 he, and stuff that's funny to, to him is not funny to most. And all he's trying to be is a comedian. And, and unfortunately, it takes a while for you to learn that he wasn't trying to bully you. He was trying to make fun of you. But he's this big 300-pound guy that you're that. kind of intimidated by. So exactly. You, okay. So. Okay. So you and Suge had this relationship that stemmed from, from your childhood. Um, your dad was uh, Compton PD, and then he went on to become, I guess, uh, a sheriff? That was later. Later, okay. That's, that's later. Okay, so your, your dad is Compton PD, mm -hmm. part of the gang unit. Uh Death Row starts to form. Okay. Does, does Suge have a relationship with your dad? They, he, everyone knew of my dad because of his, his, um, his ties to the, 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 the streets or the community okay. as law enforcement in this game. By then, he's moving up. He's supervisor over the game. He having guys that work for him, like a Mark Anderson, two guys that you interviewed before, Brendan and Ladd. Yeah. These are guys that he kind of took up under his wings and trained him his way of doing law enforcement as far as getting intelligence. See, back in the late, the early 90s, right after the riots and all of that, prior to that, cops just believe, believed in kicking ass, taking names. They went into this community policing and, and getting information. But one thing about Reggie Sr., <laughs> not Junior, Sr., he was all about talking to people, communicating with people, developing a relationship with people. Because he grew up in the Imperial Courts Housing Projects and. Um, and he knew that, you know, everybody are not bad people. And he started telling all these people are not bad people. Yeah. These are just people that's dealt a different hand. Yeah, and, and it's one of the, I, you, know, you always hear this complaint that you have these lower income communities and the cops don't come from those communities. So, yeah. you know, that's where a lot of problems stem. Whereas, I guess with your dad and you as well, you guys come from that same community which you end up policing. Correct. So it's a different type of relationship, I guess. Yeah, and you have cops, like myself, that grew up in that area that were assholes. <laughs> that right. just didn't learn and didn't know. And, you know, unfortunately, it was later in my, my law enforcement career, which was short, it was only 11 years, uh, that I, I started saying, oh, wait a minute. Let me try to be, you know, take on his way of doing things. Because I kind of, at the beginning of my law enforcement career, try to take on that kick ass and take names, um, and I was young, I was 21, 22 years old, uh, which was too young in my opinion to be able to have the power that you have as law enforcement, but that's another story. But um, uh, unfortunately, it took me a while to learn that this is not the way to go. Any really bad experiences as you were policing Compton? Any shootings, attempted murders on, on your, you know, in terms of people trying to get at you or no, so I forth? I didn't have any, I, I was involved in my uh, tenure as a police officer in two officer-involved shootings. Okay. However, um, to my knowledge, I didn't have any threats or anything towards me or any shots that would have actually fired at my police vehicle. Okay. You always was in the area where you heard shots, <laughs> but, but. Did you actually have to shoot anybody in, in, the, in your line of work? On two different occasions. Okay. Did the piece of people die or no? No. Okay. One guy was wanted for attempted murder. Uh, his name was Yogi from uh, the Willow Street, a Mexican gang. Mm -hmm. And um, 
He had a gun on him. He didn't want to go to jail. He was telling me, begging me, Reggie, I'm not going to jail. I'm not going to jail. And he reached for the gun. And unfortunately, I had to stop him. That's the term we use for shooting someone. Yeah. You try to stop him. You're not trying to kill him. You're not trying to, you're trying to stop him. Yeah. And another guy was uh, robbing uh, a John uh, on Long Beach Boulevard and went in foot pursuit and chased him. And um, he, he, he ran into a location where he turned quickly with the gun and he was stopped as well. Okay. And they both lived? They both lived. At one point, I guess you, you had a medical retirement? I, got, I received a medical retirement from the city of Compton in 1996. I had a, a traffic accident, and I have what you call vascular necrosis in my right ankle. So Sugar and Dre formed Death Row. And at what point does Sugar reach out to you for security services? Okay. Well, some will say Suge, Dre, Doc, DLC, and... Yeah. And Dick Griffey <laughs> for yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we have for the whole death row. yeah. But I'm not gonna get into that. Right. Uh, but ultimately it was uh Shug and Dre and um uh, that formed death row. The, I wasn't reached out until uh, the end of nineteen ninety four is when I started officially working for Death Row Records. Ninety four. Ninety four. The end of ninety four. Okay, by ninety four they were fully established. They were doing great. Yeah, mm-hmm. multi, like, The Chronic was out, Doggy Style was out. Above the Rim was out. Above the Rim was out, uh, Murder Was the Case was out. It was coming out. Well, that's it was when coming I out? Yeah. Okay, so that was before Pac got there? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, the Dog Pond album, I guess, was no, out? No, oh, it wasn't out yet. Not, okay. Not yet. But still, you're talking about big, multi-platinum albums. Correct. Death Row was a, was a money-making machine. It was doing very well at that time. Okay. Uh, so what had happened was... Um, like I said, I had a, a, I was already dealing with a, the medical issue, my my right ankle. You know, I was having hard pr- trouble with my uh, medical with my right ankle, which I eventually got retired for. Uh, but what happened was we had got intel that um, a few of the guys that was working for Death Row Records was planning on robbing and kidnapping Chuck and holding them for ransom. One of his employees? Yes, homeboys. Okay, quasi-employees. Yeah. We're planning on kidnapping him and, and, and ransoming him. him. Yes. Trying to get a ransom for him. Correct. Okay. My father got that intel. Got it. My father just wanted to pretty much give him heads up. Say, hey, sure, you know. And so we met. I remember the corner. We met at this dairy on the corner of Lone Beach and Murr. And uh, which happened to be in Southside Crips area, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, but we we met at that dairy, and um, we were talking, and and Shug was like, you know, he he rubbed it off, pretty much. I don't know if he believed it or not, but you know, knowing Shug, he just like, yeah, yeah, well, I you know, I'll deal with that. I don't believe that, um, but that's why y'all need to be over here watching my back anyway. That's pretty much what he said. Y'all need to be with me. Me, I'm 26, 27 years of age at the time, you know. Seeing what they doing, the uh, the things that was going around Death Row, and, and, and I was kind of intrigued to make some money. I didn't plan on leaving my career as a police officer at the time, mm-hmm. but to make some extra money. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I want to do it. My father was like, oh, man, half the guys that's working for you, I'm trying to get them <laughs> on some cases myself. I'm not coming, you know, okay. I have no interest. So your dad turned it down? Yes. But you did not? I didn't turn it down. Uh, however, at that point, I wasn't the one, the main guy. Uh, my father suggested another lieutenant uh, by the name of Danny Sneed that should, uh, had a relationship because his sister and his wife were good friends and suggested, and he had a uh, private security company by the name of Code 4 that he was affiliated with. And he suggested that maybe we all work together and provide security for his major events, not to eventually the bodyguard work and the, the day-to-day operations, but just for events that he was having. And okay. that's how we started off. Okay, but eventually you formed Right Way Security. Correct. That came later? That came later. Okay, so how did that come about? That came about, um, I was I was had pretty much at the point where I had to get retired, was about to get retired, 
And this is then at the El Rey Theater had happened with, and this company Code 4 uh, Security was the uh, security company. And I had some disagreements with the way things were done and felt that they didn't do things that they should have done. And I decided at that point that I was going to um, form my own security company. Okay. And then Suge hired Rightway? I was already employed for Death Row. And um, eventually, yes, he hired Rightway. Uh, or I hired Rightway as um, you know, the, the director or the chief of uh, security for Death Row. Okay. So being head of so you're, you're basically head of security for death row. Yeah, of security for death row. Okay. Now, I, I've interviewed a lot of people okay. from death row, affiliated with death row, and so right, forth. So. And, you know, the way it got described to me was like, it was kind of like a, a gang banging frat house. Okay. You know, where gangsters were, were everywhere around, there was guns and dope all around. Uh, it was a fairly chaotic environment. Yeah, when you say dope, I don't like to use the term dope. Um, I didn't see any dope. I've never seen any dope outside of uh, uh, marijuana. Okay, but guns? There was probably uh, an illusion that guns were around or people felt that they were around because of the type of guys that were there. But to say they were just laying on a table or, or walking around uh, with their shirt up and a gun hanging out of their pockets, that's not accurate. That's not true, okay. Well, you, you also hear a lot of stories about the, the violence that happened uh, at death row. Apparently there was like a room in the back without a door handle and when things, when they didn't like somebody, they got dragged in the back of the room and they beat the shit out of them. I, while I was there, our, our security, I never heard of an incident like that. I'm not saying that people didn't get slapped or there wasn't some assaults that happened, but I never saw or witnessed any incident like you just okay. explained. You know, you also hear about the incident of Suge making someone drink piss. That happened allegedly at a, uh, a, a Christmas party. Okay. Where uh, one of Mark, I think his name was Mark Anthony Bale or something like that. One of uh, a guy that was working for... Uh, Puffy and Suge. Puffy and Death Row. He was working with Street Team. If yeah. I knew anything about Street Team guys back then. They, they were independent contractors that worked projects for every record company that was hot at the time. Especially the urban record companies. Mm -hmm. Um, that incident was later found, or I think he signed a agreement and a settlement where he said she wasn't one of the ones that was uh, Dr. Dre and a couple of other people that were the ones that, uh, that, was, that had assaulted him. Okay. So you're saying you didn't see any of this violence or anything? I like didn't that. see it. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but okay. I didn't personally witness it. Well, um, I interviewed Greg Kading. Okay. Uh, I think, I guess, did you see the interview or the one that I did? I may have saw snippets okay. of it. Uh -huh. He said that a law was passed that you're not supposed to provide uh, that, that cops um, or, or armed bodyguards aren't supposed to provide um, protective services for convicted criminals. Hmm. So there was a compromising issue there. I wasn't aware of it and it definitely didn't happen on my watch because my police chief was trying to, well, he stopped us. He pulled our work permits. Well, what happened was you had to have work permits to work for these type of, to work any off-duty job. And the word had got around that Right Way Protective Services, which was my security company, was supplying security because I was one of the first ones that started this, you know, off-duty or retired police officers working for the rappers or these uh, so-called, you know, bad guys. And um, so eventually they had gave us permission to work because they didn't know they was working for right way protective services. But the federal government was following us around or different uh, task forces following us around was seeing the guys always having these armed guys around them and they're not getting in, in trouble <laughs> like they were. And, and they, they getting their stuff together and they didn't like it. And so they started going around to the different police chiefs and said, hey, this guy is working for you. I mean, working for these guys. Did you know that? And they were like, yeah, well, they, they, they work for Right Way Protective Services. They said, well, Right Way Protective Services is working for the guys. And so what happened? They eventually started pulling 
their work permits and, tell, and banning them from working for Right Way Protective Services is okay. what happened. But they didn't pull your work permit? I was, by that time, I was on my way out to get retired. Okay. I had uh, started my medical retirement. Okay. But yes, a lot of the guys that worked for Compton Police Department, mm -hmm. uh, they were um, pulled there as, as well and banned us for working for them and told us that we, they couldn't, yeah. that we couldn't. You had this kind of interesting situation at death row where you had Suge that was blood affiliated and all of his guys. Then you had Snoop that was a crip and the whole dog pound situation, you know, along with Trady and so forth, and, and there was there was friction originally. You know, occasionally would happen between the two. Because I remember Trady said, you know, talked about a situation where I guess Warren G's chain. Some dude snatched Warren chain in the parking lot of K and M in like about 90, 95, 96, something like that, and had ran and um, ran back up in the in the K and M, and so Warren G went and got C style, and they went. And, you know, they hollered at Suge, and Suge brought him in the room with the, you know, the big red death row rug with the, they don't step on the logo with right. the dome and pincher, but Damu right there and all this. And it was just a lot of theatrics, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, dude, you getting tickets. What, what's really going on, you know what I'm saying? Well, because that, that's Dre's stepbrother. Mm. Right? Oh, he got his he got his chain back. We wasn't leaving one unless he was getting the chain back. Uh, something was something else was gonna happen. We we wasn't like that. wasn't no wasn't nobody getting punked at death row when I was there. There were incidents that happened, but they all got worked out. I can tell you of incidents where they all sitting together, uh, and I walked in the room and they drinking Hennessy and smoking weed together as well. Mm -hmm. And so they had incidents that happen yeah just like bloods on bloods had incidents that happen right guys that work for me had incidents that happen but um the, the, at the, the bottom line they all got together yeah. and there was to this day still no friction among the the lone beach guys and the compton guys there are rumors that you were blood affiliated i grew up in a, a neighborhood where uh um, Bloods grew up, <laughs> Pyrus, not Bloods, Pyrus. Yeah. I grew up with the, the, the same guys that eventually went to jail in the penitentiary and stuff like that. I was in their sandbox. I played baseball at Kelly Park with them. I played <laughs> basketball at Luther's Park with them. I went to elementary school with them. What am I supposed to do? This is the environment that I grew up in. Okay, but did you ever affiliate yourself officially with I any of that? never claimed to be a Pyru or a Blood or a Crip or anything. I was Reggie who was a police officer whose, whose daddy was Reggie Sr. Yeah. <laughs> who was a cop. Who everybody so. knew. <laughs> everybody knew. Yeah. So, that's no. You, you're working with Death Row, and then Pac comes out of prison and joins. Correct. And you were there as that's happening. I picked up, I was with Shug when we was going to negotiate the, uh, the release of Pac from the jail, I was the one and flew up with him about three or four times to the penitentiary. And um, uh, once or twice, you know, you had some other artists, Danny Boy accompanied us or some other people. But all three to four times that Shug and David Kenner went up there, uh, I was there as well. Okay, so were you actually sitting with Shug and Tupac? No, no, I stayed in, in the car. Okay. Uh, yeah, I didn't go inside the prison. Got it. Okay. But I was the one that picked him up from the airport when he arrived at LAX. Aha. So, Pac gets out of prison, mm -hmm. arrive, arrives at LAX. I think he stayed in New York for a day, okay. to be honest, when he got re released. Yeah. And then he got on a plane. I don't know. I forget how that happened. But I remember picking him up about 5 p.m., 6 p.m. on on a day, his first day from being, you know, coming to L.A. Okay. Did you have the death row chain for him and everything? Or? No, that's all TV. That's, that's all TV. That's <laughs> TV, no. He didn't have a death row chain at that time. Okay. But you went and grabbed Pac. And I, and I, you know, from the stories I heard from a bunch of different people, um, I guess he went straight to the studio? We took him straight to Canel, uh, Canel Studio. And they were there partying, having a good time. Got out of jail. Signed a death row. Got off the plane. Got off the plane. We like, what up? What up? <laughs> went to the studio. No, we went to go eat. Went to go eat. At Monty's. 
Okay, and Monty's. And then we went to Can Am. Went to Can Am Studios. And then I had the five songs with the hooks already on there. And then he said he liked that one, so he went in there and redid the Ambitious of a Rider hook. Oh, so you already had the hook written? Yeah. Oh, because so you, you know that hook come from Snoop. You know, like back in the days when he had on Stranded on Death Row. That, uh, I'm not flagging, but I'm just, just sagging. sagging. I don't deny it. Oh. Same, you know same saying? cadence. Yeah, yeah just yeah. different words, you know, because I had the beat, boom, 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 you know what I mean? So he came in and knocked them five out, and I was like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> what people don't know, and they think he did a whole bunch of songs that day, <laughs> Pac did, and I guess he, he was so excited or not excited, for lack of a better word, but happy or feeling good, where they were smoking and drinking. He had a seizure that night. And um, I had a seizure. Had a seizure. The first night. Fell out first night out. And um, like I said, this was probably like five o'clock when his plane landed. Probably by nine, nine thirty, he had a seizure that night. Where myself and his security that I assigned him to that day was named Kevin Hackey. Uh, we had to get him and take him to the Peninsula Hotel and get him checked into his room, where he eventually stayed for about two to three months. Okay. So you're head of security of Death Row, mm -hmm. superstar label with Dre and you know Snoop and now Tupac, correct? Along with Dog Pound, and, uh, Lady of Rage, uh, Lady Jewel. Rage, Joel, everyone else like that. You guys are on top of the world. Did things change once uh, Tupac arrived? Well. <sighs> Suge stopped hanging out with Danny Boy as much. And Dre and Suge never really hung out going to clubs and stuff. We would see them at, you know, at the House of Blues. We would bump into Dre and Bruce and his security guy, uh, um, you know, at clubs and stuff like that. But to say that they were hanging out and going out together and stuff like that, no, that, that, that wasn't their relationship at all. Mm -hmm. Mainly because Dre was mainly on house arrest at the time as well. That most oh, okay. people forget about. But what was he on house arrest for? I think the D. Oh, the D. D Barnes? Barnes incident. Ah, right. Okay. Um, and so they didn't hang out as much. Um, but um, but Suge and Pac was together when you're going out to clubbing and stuff like that. Every every time they they went out to a club to the house, and the mainly the only clubs we went to was the House of Blues. To be honest, we didn't go to you know Roxy or Bar one, Shig and I would go to bar one a few times on Sunday nights, but uh, they wasn't hanging out like that. Um, and so, um, yeah. Okay, so Pac and Shug got real close. They they were real close. Okay. And at one point, Dre wanted to leave. Yeah. Correct. Dre wanted to leave. Um, his reasoning, uh, I believe, is all behind Michelle, but. Right, because Dre had a baby with Michelle A. Correct. And Michelle A started messing with Suge. Correct. And she eventually had a baby by Suge as well. I mean, we're talking years. Years later, yes. yeah. I interviewed Michelle A. Yeah. Yeah, we, we talked about all that. One night I couldn't find him, and I, said, I called Suge and I said, listen, you know, I need milk and pampers. I don't, I don't have any money to do that. And, um, I didn't want to take my baby out. It was like one o'clock in the morning. So I should actually send somebody to bring me money, you know. So I was like, thank you. And then when I would do shows, Dre would be all cuddled up in a booth. My show. He's my boyfriend. And Suge would have to take these girls. And this wasn't even his club and tell them, you got to get out. You know, he was just, be, you know, he started seeing that this man is mistreating this girl. And she's trying to really be with you. Mm -hmm. And so... Every Christmas and every, every Christmas and every birthday for like about a year or two, he would get me um, like jewelry, and I would say, "Sugar, I can't accept this because you know I, I have, you know him and you have you're married." He would go, "No, what's from well, me?" Sugar was married. At he the time? was married to Sharita, okay. and I said, "Oh, I said, well, I can't." He said, "It's from both of us. It's okay." I said, "Oh, okay. We'll tell her thank you and everything." So she must have thought I was really crazy when I would see her and go, "Thank you so much." She probably didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> As I think about it. But um, he just, you, he worked on me, you know, and, and it just eventually, and then he was a confidant. Yeah. She may have left out a few things because she was the one that was telling Shug 
about Dre Exit plan and all of that. Oh, really? So, so Suge was already hearing things, and so that's why he escalated some the escape plan with, through Jimmy Iovine. So Jimmy is the one that Suge was like saying, "Hey, get rid of this guy. <laughs> you got to make something happen. This dude is," and so they both used Jimmy Iovine to to make that split happen. And from what I understand, Jimmy wrote Dre a hell of a check. <laughs> To uh, leave? You know, to eventually, you know, f- form a company directly with Interscope. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, he helped him out. I'd heard oh. like $100 million or something. No, like it wasn't that, that much. Uh, I remember, because Jimmy and I were very close. We used to talk a lot. And at one point, uh, Dre was after the firm and everything. Before Eminem came, he was $21 million unrecouped. Mm. And that's when he had to downsize his house, move out to the valley, and all of that because Jimmy couldn't take care of him like he was supposed to because Edgar Boffman was on him, which was the new company that had just bought Universal. Uh, and, and, and Jimmy couldn't do the things that he, want, that he used to could do for Dre. So Dre had to take a drastic uh, downsize. But thank God for Eminem. <laughs> yeah. So for example, I heard a lot of stories like Gerardo mentioned. I heard stories when Suge, well, break the door in and, and somebody had not given him his check and they he picked them up and, oh yeah i wait, heard wait, story wait, wait, wait. So, i can't say names <laughs> okay you don't have to say names uh-huh. so you're saying suge would show up to interscope uh-huh. kick the door down yeah and pick someone up over his head yes because uh because there was a check was, check was not ready the check was not ready from interscope to death row yes sir were you witnessing any of this? I never witnessed any of that. She didn't do those tactics or antics around me. And, and you got to remember when he had to do antics or tactics like that, this was, I wasn't hanging out with him daily. Like I said, originally, I was just there for uh, events, video yeah. shoots. Uh, when they had the murder was the case release party in New York, the murder was the release party in LA. That was my role setting that depositions with, 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 with David Kenner when um, they were going through the, the, the depositions or the, you know, on the Snoop murder trial, they were also getting sued. And so the, you know, when they were interviewing people and having depositions with them, that was mainly my, my job duties in 94, 95. And so she pretty much had his homeboys and stuff rolling with him daily. If we go out to a club at the palace or something like that at the beginning, then I would roll with Shug. I remember a few times going to the uh, Prince Oak Club, um, mm-hmm. rolling with him like that. But that was mainly my duty. So. In 1995, there was a Source Awards Correct. situation. Correct. Where Suge grabbed the mic and said, for all you artists who don't want your CEO on the video dancing, come to death row. <laughs> and it's unfortunate that the crowd and you categorize it as grab the mic. He was presented a war. He had won label of the year. Okay, you're right. You're right. <laughs> uh, so he was pre- presented a war and he was given his, his speech. Fair enough. Uh, but at that point, what he was doing, most people don't know, he and I had just got off a plane from signing the deal and David Kenner with Tupac Shakur at the prison. We had just got off. And um, like a day before, we had flew out before everybody else and he had and they completed that deal. If you look closely in the cage, because on the set, Suge had it, well, or Dre, because Dre was the master of designing stuff like that. They had it where they had each artist, when they were singing their verse on the Murder Was the Case soundtrack, mm-hmm. come out of a cage. If you look closely in the cage to the far right, Tupac is in there. We had a, when it got a big picture of Tupac, and we had placed that picture of him inside of one of the cages. That was really Suge way of letting people know that Tupac was now signed and was going to be with Death Row. Okay. And that he had Tupac's back. And so he was starting his beef with Puffy then for, for Tupac. Okay, because Tupac felt some type of way about the, situ- the shooting situation at Quad Studios. Uh, felt that Biggie didn't help him out, as well as who shot you came out, exactly. which Tupac took personally. Yeah. What people don't know about, most people don't know about the jails. <laughs> people in jail and the penitentiaries hear things on, 
hear things in there before most of us do on the streets. And so Tupac was getting word, and he was also feeling a type of way of like, if I'm coming here to see you, like when you call me for this interview, if I would have uh, came here and then something would have happened to me in the lobby while I was sitting waiting for you to arrive, yeah. and then you never come and check on me, saying, what's up? Right. Hey, Reggie, what happened? You know, I'm sorry that happened. Or, right, be my responsibility. He kind of felt that way about. Yeah, which makes sense. Yeah. So what happened with the Soul Train Awards? Soul Train Music Awards. Um, well, what happened was, um, Sugar, we, we went through the back. It was, uh, Sugar was driving one car. Uh, then he was in the Hummer. And I think he had Tupac and some of the outlaws uh, in, the, in the Hummer with them. Myself and Frank Alexander, the, the security that was assigned to Tupac, was behind them. Uh, we were initially uh, trying to bring in our entourage. We were like 50 deep. <laughs> Don Cornelius was very smart. He uh, said, hey, the only one's coming in this back, <laughs> the back gate is, you know, Tupac, you know, and Shug and their security. Everybody else have to go around towards the front, mm -hmm. which, thank God, that's what happened. Because we'd probably all still be in a penitentiary if um, we all would have came back there. Because we had about 50 to guys with us in some t-shirts that all said, I believe he had, they had Bompton on it, mm. or, or it may have been P-Funk, one or two. What does P-Funk mean? Pyro Funk, like, oh, okay. like, you know, for the Pyro's. Got it. And so he had a bunch of guys with him because the plan was, their plan at that time was, I believe, that I overheard that they were going to rush the stage and pull Biggie off that stage that particular day. Uh, but they were forewarned, the security there, um, because I knew the guy that ran the security by the name of Keith Davis, and they didn't allow them in into the, into the facility. So since you were around while Suge was working out his deal with Tupac, one of the stories that you hear different sides of is that uh, Suge put up the bail money, but then another story is that the record label put up the bail money. Okay. Do you know what happened? Yeah, definitely. Um, initially, let's just go from the beginning. Suge had no intentions on trying to sign Tupac or anything. Tupac was broke. Um, his wife at the time reached out to Suge and just asked for some money. Suge shot $15,000, put it on his books, and said, hey, here's $15,000. If you need anything, call me. That's when Tupac reached out to Suge and said, hey, Come and see me. She had no intentions then, even thinking that he can get out of this deal with Interscope. He went up there to see him. That's when they started talking, and Tupac was saying, "Hey, you know, they, you know, my record company is doing doing me wrong, which was Interscope. They, you know, they don't want no parts to deal with me." Right, but but Suge has a deal with Interscope as well, and a relationship. Jimmy and Suge saw every yeah. day, every Sunday. They were playing football at his Malibu house. I right. mean, Jimmy was good to Suge. Yeah. And Dre, but they, he was good to them at that time, good man. And um, so I guess they, in their conversations, Jimmy was like, hey, you can deal with him. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired of dealing with him. And that's when Shiv was like, okay, we can make this happen. Hey, David, you think we can get him out on a appeal bond? What can we do? Now, yeah, Intersco pay for everything for Death Row. That's what their deal. They advance everything. But they know they're going to get their money back because they were hitting home runs. But Jimmy paid, he advanced all the money on video shoots. He advanced the money on studio time. He advanced everything. Should deal with, with Interscope was they had a 50-50, which was a crazy deal. Master P deal, we hear about that with, with priority. was a, a better deal. But if you got the money and the liquid to do it, should deal with Interscope was 50-50. What I mean? We split 50% of everything after everything is paid for, but you advance everything. And so, yeah, Interscope cut the check. Trust me, that million and a half got billed back to Shug and Death Row Records. Right, which they had to recoup at one point. Which they had to recoup. 
Okay, so it's, it's kind of both true. Yeah, I, I, I see exactly. What you mean. So back to the Source Awards. They go and, and do this presentation, you know, they, they do this performance of Murder Was the Case. And, and I remember Pac was actually in the Murder Was the Case, you know, it was in the Natural Born Killers video. He was in Natural Born Killers, yeah. Yeah, he played the sniper yeah, at the end. Right. And I guess Pac mentioned uh, that Suge wrote him some huge Well, that was for Above the Realm. He gave some money there for yeah. above the, for that. Oh, oh the Above the Rim song. Above the Rim yeah, song yeah, he right. gave him. Uh, exactly. Uh, They're yeah. already kind of doing some business. Yeah. yeah. So they do this, uh, you know, this performance, the Source Awards, and there's a picture of Pac, as you in, say, in the, in, the, in the jail cell. That's what, and he was signed. Most people don't know the deal was executed. Yeah, he was already signed and at that point. And I mean, Pac knew he was on his way home. Yeah. On the appeal bond. So Suge gets presented, you know, the Label of the Year Award. Yeah. He gets on the mic. And he basically disses Puffy. Correct. That's what happened. And everyone is booing. Some. Some. Some booing. Some clapping. Some go, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's all type of reactions. Well, but they're in New York. You guys we're are New all York. in New York exactly. as you're doing this. But we bought 100, 150 deep Suge at the last minute. And so that's when Suge must have knew what his plan was. Yeah. But Suge at the last minute flew out. Every artist on the label. Every artist was on, was sitting in that area. Yeah. Every, pretty much a lot of the homeboys. I probably had about 10 security guards out there. And so we were deep. Yeah. You guys go to the tunnel afterwards. Correct. And then Puffy and Suge run into each other? They didn't run it. Well, yeah, they, I mean, we went to the tunnel knowing that they were going to be there. Yeah. But they came over. Puffy talked to them. You know, people around not know what the conversation was. So it, it seemed to be tense. But, you know, Puffy. Sure. <laughs> well, I, I remember it was the uh, conversation this went. They talked. It was on Drink Champs, okay. uh, Nori's podcast. He had Puffy on there, and Puffy said that when him and Suge talked, Suge said, "I was talking about you. I was talking about uh, Jermaine Dupri." Mm. Any, any truth in that? No. Puffy knew. <laughs> Puffy was. You gotta remember, P Puffy. It, it sounds like bullshit. It's, but... It was. It was a good cleanup, but and you know what? Knowing Suge is something he might have said. Oh, really? Eventually. Not that night, but eventually I got word back to him. But th at that day, it was tense. Everybody was talking. and But Suge and Puffy were cool at one point. I, I done been over with Suge at Puffy office, but we done missed planes where they want to talk because Puffy knew the FBI was following him and he was asking him, hey, how did you get them off you? How you beat this case? How you get the feds from off you? Because they on me bad. And they done had those type of conversations and stuff like that. But what Suge really got a bad taste with Puffy, and when he was already kind of not feeling Puffy, was because it was a fight in November or December of 95 that we were already having Club 662 six open when we were doing the parties at the club, and Biggie was hot. You know, we can't take it away from him. And Suge asked Puffy to have Biggie to come and perform at the... Uh, at the club for that fight, you know, at the party. And I think Puffy demanded something like the door, where she just thought he should have just got a fee. And and at that point, she just told him, oh, no, well, I have the doll pound, I'll have somebody else perform, but. Well, but wasn't there some sort of altercation that happened where Suge and Puffy are the same club and Big Suge's thing. friend gets killed? Now, we all talking about the same timeline. I mean. We probably, when that conversation happened, it was probably sometime in October, you know, when he was trying to, you know, schedule the uh, Puffy and them to, to perform. I think the big Jake incident happened with, at the Jermaine Dupri uh, party in like maybe November or October of 95. It was before Tupac came on. Uh, so it was a little bit before Tupac, but that incident, all of this stuff happened after the Source Awards, okay. which we know the Source Awards was in August of 95. Okay. So, so Suge's friend gets killed Correct. at that club. Mm -hmm. Was he blaming Puffy for it? Because I remember there was some sort of, a, I think it was like the Biggie and Tupac series that they kind of reenacted it. Yeah. And there's the scene where Suge is like blaming Puffy for, for the, you know, indirectly for the death of his friend or something like that. Yeah, he, he blamed uh, Puffy or his boy Wolf, Wolf. Or in, on, in the entourage for that incident. Okay, Wolf is now dead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I got it. So, so now it's really, it's really it's personal now. And then we have the, the shooting where Biggie get on the, 
radio and pump up uh, the doll pound trailer getting shot up. Right. This and is then, like December yeah. of 95. Yeah, right. So all and of then, this is going yeah, on. The, yeah, the, the, the dog pounder filming New York, New York, Correct. Brooklyn, Biggie gets on the radio, Hot 97. And I've interviewed a few people about this. Yeah. Uh, Trey D kind of detailed okay. the whole thing and mm-hmm. then they get shot at. He was on the phone the day before. Wait, so he was on the radio. Saying this on the radio on Hot 97. Live on the radio and they let him they let him like it was the chat line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he was calling out names, you know, yeah, yeah. B gutter, you know, uh you know, they got them names you can't even make up out the pillowcase, uh, uh you know, uh snot rag, you know, they you know, baby boo boo, you know, they you know, they got wild names out there. So he he named about five or six names and yeah, they, they, next morning when we went to film um, some pickup shots in the snow in Red Hook, yes, they shot at us from like about, it had to be at least, at least about a mile, mile and a half away. They were sniping into the trailer, whoever it was. It got a pop shot, you know, it wasn't like a whole bunch of shots, but a pop shot went in their trailer. Yeah, still. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm serious. Could hit anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Someone could have gotten hit in the head. Yeah. And we really do feel that Biggie uh, incited that. I agree. Yeah. Completely. You get on the radio and you tell. Say, hey, how are we allowing them to film? They over there yeah. at such and such location, filming this in New York, where they didn't. Snoop and the Dog Pound still to this day don't believe they were this in New York, because they figured they were paying homage to New York, and that they gave up 100 percent of the publishing. To a New York, uh, I I interviewed Corrupt. Okay, about this song. All we gave a fuck about was winning over New York and them saying, "You guys are good." Huh? You guys are. T-. That's all we gave a fuck about. Not record sales, none of that. But you just, I just wanted to be known as a great MC. And they shot at us, cause while well, we kicked everything the fuck over. So, because uh, we don't know who the shooter is, and right. it was no fuck. He was like fucking dust in the wind, nigga. Nobody know who Cub is. So originally, it, it, the whole concept of the video was supposed to be completely different. It was supposed to be the whole a, concept a, a, of the original to, video was to yeah. get all the New York rappers in with us, yeah, and have a good time. We was Times Square. We wanted Nas there and Biggie and yeah. Everybody that was rocking at the time, we wanted them right there. Big L, I think was still alive. Big L, yeah. we in the mall. Come on through, man. This this record is dedicated from the West Coast to you guys huh. who opened up these doors for us. They didn't see it like that. Kicking over the <laughs> buildings. The buildings, yeah. They did that. With, DJ Pooh did that. That's when they... Uh, that was his beat, yeah. Yeah, DJ Pooh. A hell of a beat, too. Yeah. Okay. So everything is a, is a mess at this point. Correct. And then Tupac drops, hit him up. Drops, hit him up. Well, uh, well he did a little things before that. He, you remember the skit before Two of America Most Wanted? Uh, Two of America Most Gangsters, you know, when he do the Scarface skit. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So You're right. Two of America's Most Wanted with, yeah. uh, with, with Snoop. Snoop. Yeah, at the and beginning there, of that. Scarface so he's letting scene. us know now. That's when he's telling us. And now he's doing interviews. Uh, Shug is on there telling people, hey, get your records. Yeah, records out because we about to drop them, you know. So it's, it's starting to heat up. Yeah, and uh, you're head of security. Are you worried at this point? That's hip hop <laughs> in my mind at that time. That's that's this rap stuff. That's this gangster rap. So I'm not knowing. I'm not that smart. I'm not catching it. I'm not saying, hey, you know, this this is getting too deep. I'm not. Yeah. And I'm 28 years of age. I'm not that smart. Right. I'm but not you're also that wise. not the de- you're also not the decision maker. I couldn't have did anything. At all. That's what people would be like, well, Tupac should have been riding like this. or Yeah. These guys not going to ride like this. They're going to ride in the car with whoever they want to ride in. Right. They're not going to be riding in the car with security. Okay. <laughs> and, and I guess Club 662 that you mentioned, the 662 is a blood thing? That's what that means. I didn't mention that, but I'm sure you don't heard that. 662 is on the phone, on the, uh, the dial tone of a phone, you look at a phone, mm-hmm. in the old days when we used to have the push-button phones, yeah. M-O-B is 662 Right on your phone. That's uh, that's, Mob that's Piru. What, members of the Blood. Oh, that's what it stands for? Members of the Blood. Members of the Blood. Got it. Which Piru is a Compton thing, 
uh, Pacoima, and you don't hear too many LA guys that are blood affiliated Holland Pyro. They say blood. Uh, Compton D really DJ grew Quick, up. I think, is is one is a Pyro. But he grew up in Compton. Yeah, that's Fruit Town, which is west side of Compton. Yeah, yeah. So this whole thing is heating up, and then the Mike Tyson fight. Okay. Happens. Which one? In Vegas. The one where Tupac was shot. Yeah. Okay. So. Tupac, Suge, the Outlaws, you and your security, and a bunch of other people, Trayvon Lane, all head down to Vegas. Yeah, I was already out in Vegas. I was uh, preparing to get in the club, um, uh, getting the club situated. and um, Club 662. Club 662. Because that's also a death row or Suge Knight entity. And, yeah. I'm and, and the, the after party was supposed to be at that at club. club 662. Got it. And um, what we needed was some type of uh, I believe some type of alcohol cards that you need to have where all your guards need to have to uh, to work inside the club. It's any employee inside of the club in Vegas had to go through this particular class, and so I was making sure all my guards was going through that particular class so we could have the cards because we knew we was going to get checked that night for those particular cards and for our credentials and to make sure that everything was set up correctly at Club 662. How many of your security guys were there in Vegas? Uh, from 20 to 25 to work Club 662. A lot? Yeah. Okay. The Mike Tyson fight happens? Correct. Were you actually at the fight? No. I was at Club 662. You were at Club 662? Yes. Okay. After the fight, after the, the Tyson fight, the altercation happens at Correct. the MGM Hotel. You yes. were not there either? I wasn't aware of it, and I wasn't there as well. Okay. But you, I guess, were friends with Trayvon Lane? Oh, Trayvon grew up three or four houses away from where. He's a lot younger. Uh, he's about uh, seven to eight years younger than I am. Okay. Which is a big thing in growing up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're talking about third grader and a tenth grader. Yeah. Um, but he, you know, he grew up in the neighborhood where I grew up. Okay. Three or four houses down the street. Got it. So this is someone you've known Correct. a lot of your life. Correct. Suge as well? Yes. Got it. Did you hear about the, the incident? At the Lakewood Mall? You yeah, about? that incident. Yes, we, yeah. we, we was aware of the Lakewood Mall incident. Okay. What, was Trayvon's chain stolen during the incident or no? No. It was an attempt. Okay, so they, they, they jumped him, I guess. They attempted to take uh, his chain. Him, a guy named Mo. And K-Dub, it was three of them, and um, I'm hearing, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 different guys from the South Side Compton Crips that was there. Who knows? Right. But and Baby Lane was involved in that. He was one of the guys. Got it. Who was it? South Side Crips. Correct. And I guess South Side and, and the Pyrus were, were beefing at this point? Well, Bloods and Crips always have a uh, natural dislike for each other, but you go through uh, times when you beefing or... Usually, when school starts up, when school ends, <laughs> okay. uh, is when they really beefing or something like that. Okay. Well, the the jumping happened at the Lakewood Mall. The attempt. Okay. The attempt. Yeah. Well, he got jumped. No, not really. Uh, he wouldn't char characterize it as that. He just said okay. somebody tried to take their chain. Okay, a bunch of guys jumped. Over. Jump. When we say get jumped, I mean you got your butt whooped. <laughs> okay. So, so he's saying it wasn't as bad as people make it out. To make be. it out to be later on. Okay. Right. So Trayvon is with Suge and Pac and a couple other guys at the MGM lobby. Correct. Baby Lane walks up in the vicinity, and I guess Trayvon told Tupac that that's one of the guys that was involved in the altercation with me? Well, that's an inaccurate statement, according to Trayvon. Okay, so what did Trayvon say? Trayvon's uh, story is that uh, he saw uh, Baby Lane over there, he walked over, or came over, and was talking to Suge, Neckbone, Buntry, which are his big homies, because like I said, there's an age difference, and say, hey, pretty much, and I'm using words that, not the exact words, hey, there go that nigga that tried to jump me at the, at the mall and take my chain, talking to his big homies. Not like we all think, whispered in the Tupac ear, uh, go over to Tupac and tell Tupac, no, he's just talking to his guy who's over there. Tupac takes off. 
and run towards Baby Lane and immediately sock him, which he goes down. By that time, everybody else catching up with him, run, and then that's when they started jumping the guy. Right. They stomped him out. Yeah. So then Tupac goes back to his hotel room. He's escorted out. They all leave. Yeah. And they go. Some will say straight to Shig House. Like I said, I wasn't there, not even aware of it. Or some will say to the Luxor Hotel. I don't know which one happens. Um, oh, I'm sure it was to the Luxor Hotel to get their cars, and then they went to Shig House. Yeah, I mean, Tupac changed clothes. At the, at he's not, he's so not he's wearing. There. Yeah, different thing. But I don't know, yeah. like I said, what, what happened first okay. if they go straight to. But they eventually get to the Luxor and yeah. change. Yes. Now you're there mm-hmm. at Club 662. Now you, I guess, instruct everybody not to carry guns. Inside of the club. Inside, inside of, the, of club. the club 662. But it, even though it's your club, I mean, Shook's club. Yeah, you can carry, and I know where you're getting at, you can carry guns on your private property as long as you are. We just had, I don't believe in you, you should have, everybody should have guns inside clubs. I just think it's bad, bad for security reasons, because you have 20 guys in there with a gun, with guns, and you got maybe two to 3,000 people inside uh, of, um, small of the area. nightclub, yeah. a small area. Yeah. It's not good. Something's bad is going to happen. It could turn into a massacre. It's gonna be. Now, I had a couple of guys designated to carry guns that was going to be with the money, you know, that was at the booth. Okay, so a couple and of guys had guns. A couple of guys. We had Las Vegas PD working outside the door for crowd control. Got it. I had it all set up. And plan. Everything was set so up. So this is where it is get crazy where people... Uh, okay. Okay. Now, Tupac had his own personal security. Correct. Frank Alexander. Correct. Did he have a gun? He was supposed to. Well, because you saw some interviews later on that yeah. Frank said that you told him not to carry a gun. Yeah, but that, that became convenient <laughs> because you see in this book that he wrote mm-hmm. before all of this convenience came up and before he met up with the other people that creating stuff and creating DVDs about the stuff. You see what he said before then. He said, I had my gun on me. I had my gun, but I was going to, I left it in the car because at the last minute, Pac asked me to drive the outlaws. And instead of going to my gun, my car to get my gun, I knew it was going to be guns at the club. And we was on our way to the club. I decided not to go and get the gun and tell Pac that I didn't have my gun. I just went and drove the outlaws and, and Quincy Jones' daughter, Kadada's car, at the last minute. And I didn't want to hold up the entourage is the reason that I didn't tell anyone and didn't go and get my gun. Got it. But then that story changes once, you know, he started getting questioned about that incident. Suge and Pac and the caravan behind them start making their way to Club 662. Correct. At which point, a white Cadillac pulls up and opens fire. Correct. Pac gets hit. Suge, I guess, gets grazed. Correct. Uh, the whole car is riddled with, with bullets. Um, and, and it's always, you know, I, I just want to say this, and I, I've said this lots of times before, it, to, to think that Suge had anything to do with the shooting, I've always thought was ridiculous. Correct. You know, and I, I, I uh, even spoke to the first responder, uh, Chris Carroll, I believe, who showed up at the scene. I came up to him, I'm yell- I was yelling at him to, uh, to open the door. When I came up in the car, I could see that there was bullet holes all in the side of the door. I pulled the door open, and when I pulled it open, uh, the guy sitting in the passenger seat, who tunes out later to be Tupac, he kind of slumped out, came out with the door. So he's in the car, he's leaning against the door, and as I open the door, he kind of spills out. So he spilled out, and I just kind of grabbed him with one hand, and then I was pointing the gun at Suge with the other, because Suge is still trying to run up to me, and you know, the guy's clearly a threat. Exactly. <laughs> you know, from right. a building, oh. the whole car was sprayed up it was with bullets. Sprayed. I have a picture of it. Matter of fact, I have yeah. it on my phone, yeah. if you need to see it. Yeah. But yeah. And, and Suge gets, I guess, grazed in the head. He's, he's bleeding like, you know, he describes how Sugar's like literally squirting blood. He was also uh, just absolutely gushing blood out of the side of his head. But he's acting fine. I mean, he's not incapacitated in any way. He's shooting blood out of the side of his head, and he starts yelling at Tupac. And he's yelling at him, Pac, 
pack, and he just keeps yelling, pack. And I can see, then I look down, I can see Tupac is trying to yell back to Suge. Does anyone from the death row side return fire? Yes. Okay. Can you say who that was? Yeah, he's no longer with us. Uh, his name was Buntry. Buntry. Uh, one of Suge's right-hand guy, our good friend, uh, Alton McDonald. He uh, chased the uh, car down. He also received one gunshot to his, his vehicle. Uh, his car was shot. Uh, he had a black Toyota Supra. And him and another guy uh, returned shots at that car. Okay. And they were the ones that came straight to me at the club and told me what had just happened. Okay. So I interviewed Greg Kading. Okay. Who... Uh, basically made the deal with Keefe D. Yes. It's not a deal, it's a, an agreement. It's known as a proffer agreement. And he's given the opportunity um, through a agreement between his attorney and the United States attorney um, to evaluate um, whether or not it's in his best interest to cooperate. And so that was the, that was the arrangement, that he would sit down and tell us everything we wanted to know about anything we asked and that he had to be entirely truthful, um, or else um, he would be charged, not only for the drug crimes, but for potentially his own confession. And you actually said that Greg Kading's story is a story that you believe. Correct. Which I, I believe as well. Okay. So apparently, Baby Lane gets, gets jumped. They go in, him, Keefe, and a couple other guys who are, who are dead at this point, get together, they get their guns, and I guess they go to Club 662 first. That's what they're saying. Yes, yeah. but you would have no way of, of knowing this. The only thing that I have to uh, substantiate what they said is I've been doing interviews on this uh, web channel, YouTube channel, on Bomb First, mm -hmm. and I interview Buntry's brother, uh, Mob James, uh, James McDonald, and he said he saw him outside of the club. He said he didn't think anything of it because, you know, Crips come and, and be out there. Everybody, every hood, from every neighborhood, Mike Tyson fight. I don't yeah. even know how to explain it to people, to, to show that how people just from different neighborhoods just yeah. come to the, a Tyson fight. It's, it's like a Mayweather fight a, these yeah. days. Yeah. Everybody shows up. Yeah. I would say All-Star Weekend, if you can think yeah. back to All-Star Weekend, exactly. that was in Vegas. Right. Uh, it was just crazy, chaotic. He said he saw him, didn't think of anything of it. Until after the incident happened. Yeah, so but, I guess they, they went to Club 662, correct. saw all the death row guys in front, and kind of said, nah, we're, we're outgunned over here. Oh, they're not here yet. They're Who not knows? here yet, yeah. yeah. Whatever. Yeah. They circled back. And it could be because the police was out there, too. Yeah. yeah I remember, I think it was about 15 Las Vegas police yeah. outside working. And I guess uh, some girls had pulled up and were screaming, Tupac, Tupac, and that's how they said that Baby they Lane and Keefe you know, yeah. said that they, they uh, knew that Pac was there. Yeah. Corey and and they knew our cars. Yeah. They wouldn't have known the show car because she'll change cars. Yeah. You know, he had just got that particular BMW. Right. That car had probably had 300 miles on it, 400 miles on it. Right. Yeah. So according to Keefe, Baby Lane open fire. Tupac gets hit. Show gets hit. Buntry, I guess, shot at the car also. Gave chase. Gave chase. Buntry's car gets hit. Correct. But they don't actually catch them. Correct. They get away. Correct. Tupac gets taken to the hospital. Yes. At what point did you circle back with everybody? Uh, like I said, Buntry and the other guy came to me and told me what had just happened. There was an attorney out there that was working with us that I was kind of working hand in hand with by the name of George Kalis. He was like big time in Vegas as far as helping us uh, get the club uh, into Suge's name or, you know, turned over to a Suge entity. And um, he was there, and I didn't believe him when they first told me what was going on, what happened. I thought Suge was mad because I wasn't with him and sent them there to mess with me, is, is, was my first reaction, until I saw the po Las Vegas police cars pulling off from the club, flying Code 3 down that way. And then that's when one of the Vegas police told us what had happened. And so George Kalisa and myself jumped in the car uh, 
and went straight to the hospital because we knew that they had left the scene. Okay. How was Suge reacting to all this? <sighs> I didn't see him until about two or three hours after that incident happened. Uh, he was concerned about Pop. Um, this out of concern to say that he was upset with me or anything like that. No conversations didn't come until later. Uh, Were people blaming you because you are head of security and, and this happened um, un under your watch to a certain extent? Nobody was saying it to my face or saying it to me. Uh, we had a conversation the day when Tupac uh, died, which was the 13th, that Friday, uh, where Suge, myself, Frank Alexander, who was mainly on the hot seat, and um, uh, I think Buntree and Neckbone were there. We was in Shug backyard where they started questioning like what happened, what went down, why, why your guy didn't have a gun, why did your guy come out of the car hollering, he's a Marine, Reggie, not a cop, you know, not, I'm a retired cop because there was something where they had them pretty much proned out uh, for a minute. They had Suge and them proned out like suspects, treating them like... Right, it, yeah. When Chris Carroll showed up, yeah. he had no idea who any of these people well, were. Yeah. He saw a bunch of black guys, <laughs> you know. So he, but he had them proned out, telling them to get on the ground. Yeah. And Suge so was like, hey, you know, my, my guy's in this right. car. Yeah, he he, he describes the situation. He's okay. This big, giant guy yeah. who's bleeding is sort of hovering over him. Yeah. Now, we've still got people running around. People are yelling. I'm trying to watch these other guys a little bit. And now I've got... At this point, uh, Suge Knight is coming up behind me. And, uh, you know, I'm looking at him, and here's this guy, is giant, and I'm just like, man, this is a bad situation for me. He was a little yeah. upset about that, where he felt that Frank was saying, hey, showing him his credentials and saying, I'm a cop, and I'm working by the you know, that they would have been able to get to Pac a little sooner. Yeah. Those are the only things that I was questioning. I was directing it to Frank, who was, you know, had no clue, right. had, just lying out, you know, scared yeah. or whatever. I mean, when you look at that situation, you know, and this is something I've talked to, you know, with, uh, with the outlaws about mm -hmm. and so forth. If you connect the fight at the MGM to the shooting that happened right afterwards, you could say that Tupac died gangbanging because that situation with Orlando was a, as a gang situation. And Pac wasn't a blood, wasn't, you know what I mean? He, he, was, he was rolling with Suge and he I was associated with saying, it. But you see what I'm saying? You got, that's like us. We're not Crips or Bloods, but we could, you know, we could call 50 niggas up here and half of them would be Crips, half of them would be Bloods. You know what I'm saying? And these is all my homies that I'm a ride with. You know what I'm saying? It's the, it's the same situation, you know what I mean? Pac was riding with him, you know what I mean? Just like they was riding with him, you know what I mean? If some 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 shit kicked off, niggas would have been, been the first to ride for Pac, and he was the same way. He was riding with his homies, whoever it was. It, it could have he could have been with, you know, whoever that day. You know what I'm saying? And, and to break it down uh, even more simpler, me and you become good homies, and you get into a situation, and I defend you as a homie. Yeah. Take the gangbanger shit away. Yeah. Because me, you not a gangbanger, I'm not a gangbanger. You know what I'm saying? But you own Vlad TV. You and know they what I'm on saying? your hills. And, and niggas is on your you. hills and I ride for you. Yeah. Did I die for Vlad TV? You know what I mean? Did I die a reporter? <laughs> Did I die, yeah. you know what I mean, yeah, a journalist? I Tupac was, was the artist. He was the star. He was essentially the biggest star on the label. Correct. <laughs> yeah. At that point. Um, Snoop would debate that, but yeah. <laughs> I would say Pac was bigger than Snoop at that point. But, okay. you know, it's debatable. Yeah. They're both very big stars, yeah. regardless. Tupac didn't have to go punch Baby Lane. He had, there was lots of other people that... that oh, were, we, we totally agree. We all wish he wouldn't have done that. I'm sure it was a shock to Suge. Suge gets a bad... Suge did nine years. Well, sentenced to nine years. He only did five and a half years yeah. because, you know, how the laws were at the time. But he did five and a half years, really, trying to move everybody off of Baby Lane. 
He really was, if you really look at the tape, he was really trying to get, he yeah. sneaks one in. Yeah, he, 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 kicks, he sneaks he one kicks, in. He kicks lane. He, I, sneaks, I, one, <laughs> he sneaks one in. It, the judge on the bench there, after reviewing the tape 13 times, I determined <laughs> you kicked them. Yeah. Uh, you know, he sneaks one in. Yeah. Uh, but he was really trying to get people off of him because he knew all the cameras and yeah. all the situation. But you had said that Pac was trying to be one of the homies at that point? I don't want to put try. I don't I, if I use that word, I, I apologize to him for saying that. Right. I think he was just trying to show that he was down, or maybe that was Pac. If you look at his history, Pac was always a go-go, rider type he dude. He was. He was loyal to who he's with. Yeah. If but, he's with you, he's loyal. So. But, but Pac did get mob tattooed on his arm. Which... Uh, well, some were saying that made money over bitches. And th- I believe, well, let me just say this, I believe Pop was starting to claim the hood. Yeah. I get jammed up. Some people say, oh, he wasn't trying to be a member of the Bloods. He wasn't this. It was a short length of time. You know, he was only with us 11 months. Yeah. I don't know. Well, and That's and, not a conversation I ever had. Yeah. Well, Sh- Shock G, you know, who Pac was in the, did yeah. the underground with, you know, he did say that, and this is someone who's known Pac kind of from the beginning of oh, his, his career. I, I just did an interview with Money B, so I know. Oh, yeah. know. He, he said that Suge held Pac down the way Pac always wanted someone to hold him down. That could be a fair statement. And that makes a little sense because I remember the incident that with, with Snoop and the, uh, the uh, with Snoop when the, that we all heard of when he was mad after the Angie Martinez. Yeah, when, when Snoop, yeah, when Snoop went on the radio yeah. and said that whatever beef Tupac got, that's his beef. That's not our beef. Pretty much, or he just, yeah, pretty much that's what he so was I, saying. I got no problems with Biggie and Puffy. Exactly. And Shook and Pac was hollering, when we get back, uh, he going to have the outlaws rush Snoop and, and the doll pound, where we always joked and kind of laughed and be like, because, you know, the outlaws were, were young then. They were young guys. We were like, oh, they they need to leave that alone. <laughs> you know, the outlaws don't need to be, you know, stepping in that. Where that's what Pac was saying he was going to have done because he knew he couldn't go to Sugar and say, Sugar, I want you to have the homies to rush because that wasn't how we got down yeah. at the time. The situation happens, Tupac dies, and then uh, Suge ends up going to court because previously before that, Suge was on probation for shooting, making the those two producers strip. Uh, were you around during that time? I wasn't around. Yeah, yeah this was during yeah. the the, Duke, the Dick Stanley Griffey. brothers. Yeah, the Stanley brothers. He uh, and and I interviewed the president of Solar Records. Uh, yeah, he's a good dude. Uh, yeah. Virgil Roberts. Virgil Roberts. He detailed that whole incident yeah. where that night Suge comes into the building. You know, goes up to the to the to the third floor. And one of the Stanley brothers was on the phone. That he asked the guy to get off the phone. And he said, and I think the Stanley brothers had been part of the world class wrecking crew. And uh, they were actually there to try and get Dre, who by then is, is becoming known as a, as a hit producer, to do something for them. And so he tells Suge, he didn't know who Suge really was. He said, hey, look, I'm a, uh, I'm one of uh, Dre's guests. Go talk to him. And Suge said, I don't talk to him. I run this. He said, man, go. Leave me alone. So Suge apparently goes out, goes back downstairs to his car, gets a gun, comes back, puts the gun to his head, and says, motherfucker, I told you to get off the phone. So then he hangs up the phone. Suge brings him into the studio and has everybody, you know, people from the rehearsal, he says, I want you all to come in here. And he said, this is what's going to happen if you use that phone. Tells uh, uh, the guy to take off his clothes. And he says, I'm not taking off my clothes. So then he shoots the gun he has by the guy's ear. Then he has a guy undress, uh, and he says, could fuck you up, but I'm not going to do that. But I know where you live. I got your driver's license. I know where your mama lives. And this is just a lesson for all of you all. If you use that phone, I'm going to fuck you up. It was mainly we've been dissed. No one knew who shit was. That's when shit was standing in the background. Yeah. They didn't believe it was Suge. They were like, who are you? That's yeah. what Suge always told me. It was like, the Stanley Brothers like, this is Dre shit. 
<laughs> you yeah. can't tell us to get off the phone. He always blamed Dick Griffin. I remember we used to be at the prison talking, and he said, Dick Griffin, you're the reason I caught that case. You're the reason I'm in here. Because he was on me about the phone. You remember, phones was high then. Yeah. And so he went to the Stanley Brothers and was told him, hey, get off the phone, you know, get off the phone. Yeah. And they ignored him, and he was on, you know, he just walked back to his office. He said he was in a suit. It just came from court, from something else. Yeah. And went. Yeah, he got his gun. And, and, but he saw him looking on at the camera, and they still on the phone. So that's when he go get his gun. And, his gun yeah. made him strip. Well. Yeah. No? Yeah, that was, well, yeah, he made him strip down out of embarrassing him. He wasn't really trying to, he was just really trying to embarrass him. That's just how shit was. Like I tell you, yeah. the comedian part come out. Right. <laughs> they go outside, go straight to the police. And yeah. then he's on probation. Correct. So when he kicks the kicks uh, Baby Lane, he ends up violating his probation. Correct. And Baby Lane actually testified on his behalf. Orlando ended up testifying on Suge's behalf during Suge's trial. That's right. He perjured himself um, in order to assist Suge Knight um, get out from under his uh, his um, probation violation. Okay. And why do you think? Orlando Anderson testified on Suge's behalf after Suge is on video jumping him. He did it for one simple reason. He was getting paid to do it. Yes. Everyone assumed that Suge paid him off. That was done between attorneys. I was there. How it happened was uh, Edie Fall. You all know, know Edie Fall from the one of the guys that represented uh, on the, the Rodney King, the, the, the one with the beat up Reginald Denny. He was a pop, popular attorney from that. Well, anyway, Edie Falls and David Kenner, well, they, we all met at the studio at, the, at, at Edie Falls' office. And um, they came up with a, where they were about to sue or they were in the process of suing Tupac. And they came up to agreement with, hey, if you come and testify, because we're trying to save Shooks from going to jail to do that you know, nine year mm -hmm. violation. And testify that she was trying to really help you. He was trying to get get them off you. He wasn't one that assaulted you. He was really trying to stop everybody from assaulting you. If you'll come and testify to that, we'll give you a you know we'll settle this case with you for I think it was sixty thousand dollars, where you was going to sue Tupac, mm -hmm. which which was a great deal in our mind because we all know what Tupac was worth, especially after the All Eyes on Me and the Machiavelli album had dropped. Yeah. He was worth a lot of money. We'll sell the case for you for six thousand uh, dollars. Okay, so that's how that deal. They kind of bunched a bunch of these deals, yeah. these lawsuits together, and here's sixty thousand. You come in, you, you get on the stand and say, you know, tell. In our mind at the time, was the truth. Yeah, you say different. You say you saw a kick, but you know, we were trying to right. not see a kick. <laughs> but it didn't matter because Suge ultimately <laughs> was got found it. guilty anyway. Correct, and he was found violated for his probation. Exactly, and he yeah. went back to jail. Correct, he did five and a half years. Now, he goes back to jail, and you become the general manager of Death Row? Yes. Not eventually. It happened. Um, he, go, he, he was sentenced March of, uh, well, actually, February 29th, which some people would say crazy, but it was a leap year, I guess. Uh, February 29th of 1997. Uh, I, his brother-in-law, Norris Anderson, was the general manager at that time. Uh, I eventually took his position in about July of 97. Okay. There's a story about an off-duty cop confiscating a, a gun that they say was used to kill Tupac and I guess Hussein Fatal had it. Or You know what I'm talking about? There's this weird story yeah, yeah, yeah. about a gun. Yeah. What happened on that is Hussein Fatal was caught with a gun uh, going inside the House of Blues on July the 4th, we did a big uh, concert at the House of Blues um, uh, in L.A. Hussein Fatal was, uh, was um, trying to bring a gun in. They searched him, find the gun. They turned it over to, I think he was off-duty Santa Monica police officer or something like that. He takes the gun, and I guess he didn't book it into evidence or whatever, because they didn't make an arrest or anything. We just told, you know, Hussein couldn't come inside the House of Blues. That's when Noble comes in, who's now, for some reason, the official uh, talker for <laughs> the outlaws. Uh, but that's when he, he did Fatal's parts th that particular day. Uh, Pac and him got, you know, Pac was a little upset with him for trying to have a gun on him, 
He supposed to wreck the car. He took a car without permission. So Hussein Fatal had a bad week. So he eventually gets sent back home uh, in July. Um, and so the gun was taken off, off of him. And somehow Kevin Hackey, who we later found was working with the feds or something like that, mm -hmm. somehow he eventually get the gun. He turns the gun and gives the guns back to me. I. I don't know what I end up doing with the gun. I think I gave it to uh, Ron Bilal when we was in the Bahamas, and he told me he uh, threw it in the ocean. So the gun okay. went somewhere in the ocean in the, the Bahamas. Okay. Trust me, they have ballistics on that particular gun. They, they test that gun, and some people say, well, Pac was killed with a 40 Glock. This was the 40 Glock that he was killed with. So but, no but this yeah. happened before Pac even got killed. When the gun was taken. When the gun was taken, yeah, so yeah. it had nothing to do with it. It has nothing. That's, 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 that's the history on the gun. You gotta love the internet with their oh, yeah, <laughs> conspiracy theories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you take over the management of, of death row. Correct. And, and you're going back and forth to jail and talking to Suge and everything else like that. And I guess um, at this point, Suge and Michelle A now have a full blown relationship. They are in the open with it. Yeah. Yeah. And. Um, I guess she's signing all the checks. I guess she had a rubber stamp. She had a rubber stamp. She was a stamper. I was the one to create the checks through the company, what was needed with the bookkeeper, and then she would be the one that signs the checks. Okay. But at this point, Death Row is falling apart. Is it? Well, the artists are leaving. The artists are leaving because we no longer won them. We were selling them or getting rid of them. Right. No well, one left that were... To, uh, well, Dre's gone. Dre had left. Dre had already left. left. Dre had already left. Tupac gets killed. But he's, he's still selling records. Still, yeah, Machiavelli comes out after his Machiavelli death. Machiavelli comes out yeah. uh, until the end of time comes out. Right. Uh, oh, still oh, Our right, Rise right. come out. We yeah. selling records. Selling records. Mm -hmm. Snoop goes to No Limit. Snoop was sold to No Limit for $4.5 million, and we still had a 5 or 7% override on anything he was doing with them. Okay, I see. And we did Dogfather, which did go platinum at least. Corrupt leaves. Corrupt was sent home. Corrupt was sent home prior to that because Corrupt had an incident with Death Row, uh, that we sent him home and thought it would be best for him to go home and be with his mother for a while. Well, what was the incident? I don't want to talk about that. Okay. Daz is still around. Daz still around. Yeah. Was he like president of Death Row or something Daz like that? Was, Daz was my boy. Okay. What I meant by that, me and Daz were cool. Hanging out, we lived in the Marina City Club together. Yeah. He would come and wake me up every morning. <laughs> he got a kick out of waking me up at seven, eight o'clock in the morning, knocking on the door coming in my house smoking weed, trying to blow my house out because he knew I don't drink or smoke or anything like that. And he just got a kick of doing that. But Daz and I was, uh, he was the producer. He w we was going to do his album. Uh, he was going to be the guy, he was Dre. He was going to be the one that put music together yeah. and all of that. Yeah, he's a dope producer. Yes. Yeah. That was the problem. Daz wanted to be an artist. We just wanted to be a producer. Got it. So the company's still making money. It's not doing death row numbers because we're not out there doing those things, but we downsizing. Yeah. We don't have as much cost as we had. We don't have the distribution deal with Interscope anymore. So now we're over there with Priority, who doesn't have the money or was putting out the money okay. that, uh, that Interscope and Universal was doing. Okay. I, I interviewed Daz. Okay. Uh, and you, you saw it. I saw him. Daz said he got into a fist fight with you. I was young, I was, you know, feisty. I had fights with Suge Knight, Reggie, everybody. You know what I'm saying? And winning and slamming motherfuckers at a young age. You know what I'm saying? Well, you were having fist fights with Suge? All that shit, slamming his big ass. You know what I'm saying? What were the fights over? Money and sh other little shit and attitudes and, you know. Me and Daz have never gotten into any fight or any altercation at all. At all. Only reason Daz and I have a problem is because I exposed that Daz's wife and Suge was having a relationship. Daz's wife and Suge were having a relationship? Correct. Okay. And that's the only reason I, that I, Daz, I didn't know her Daz name was... is Maria. No, Daz's married. Daz has five kids by this young lady. Uh, but Daz was upset behind that, and Daz, uh, that's when he started tackling me. Okay, right, because he, he said that, uh, he mentioned an apartment building in Marina Del Rey. In Marina City Club. He said that he, he came out to, I guess you were driving by, he came up to your window and pretended he had a 12 gauge and... Me and Daz never had any incident like No. That. And Daz and I personally have never had bad words towards each other in person with each other. Okay. Uh, like I said, the things happened later after I stupidly, 
admit it because it exposed in retaliation of something he was saying, exposed that Suge and, and Maria had a relationship. And ever since then, he's been <laughs> okay. attacking. Well, didn't you say there was an altercation that happened with uh, you, Trayvon, and Snoop at one point? That is true. Um, at the Universal Amp, this is when Snoop was assigned to, uh, had been sold to Master P. Uh, we were there just to talk to Snoop because he was starting to diss with Suge. And so I was just going to, to talk to Snoop to say, hey, why are you dissing the home? You know, he's in jail. We let you go. We're making money off you still, but we sold you to them for four and a half million dollars and we're letting you be with Master P and now why you keep, why you throwing jabs and shit? You know, you need to leave it alone. And he was kind of high and mouthing in and all that time. And then that's when uh, uh, Trayvon uh, uh, stopped Snoop and Snoop took off and ran. Snoop was by himself? No. Snoop had Daz with him. Daz ran too. <laughs> Daz ran with Snoop. They both got arrested, ran straight to the police. That's when they both, and you can look that up, they both got arrested for marijuana possession in their, in their pockets. Uh, they have, both had marijuana on them. But um, no, he had all his dog pound friends with him. Daz also said that him and Suge got into fist fights. Another lie. You've never seen it? The Daz and Suge probably hadn't saw each other since he walked out of the visiting room crying because Suge told him he wasn't doing another album on him. Uh, he only wanted him to be a producer, but he doesn't look at him or need him as an artist. And Daz wanted to do another album, and Suge told him he wasn't going to do it. Another album on him. Okay. And Daz, and Daz walked away. Did Daz's first solo album, was that on Death Row? Yes. Okay. Revenge, Retaliation. Retaliation. Get Back. Get Back. Dope album. It did good. Yeah. Only reason it didn't do well is because of that Snoop incident. Uh, he saw his cousin get slapped and he didn't like it and um, and and he was about to schedule to do a uh, a video on It Might Sound Crazy. And after that I told him I'm doing it animated now because he was mouthing off. And I, that's when I first did that animation video uh, on, on, on that single. Yeah. First person that did the animation. Didn't get that much publicity because Master P smashed on it because <laughs> he was running priority at the time because mm -hmm. he was sick. But if y'all go look at that animation for It Might Sound Crazy, dope. Daz, uh, I think in our, in, in our interview, said that. I suck at them for the reels. I went and took all the reels and made all blanks, rewrote it, the titles on there, and gave them the reels. And I took off with the real masters. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And, and then you left Death All Row. hell broke, you know. All hell broke. Because Reggie didn't know nothing about putting the reels on there, listening to the tape and all this shit, you know. So, so you had the masters from all your shit or everyone's shit? Shit, all my shit. All your shit. And Tupac shit that I did, you know what I'm right, saying? Right, you and Tupac had a lot of songs together. Yeah. But the, the funny thing about that, that's what we did to him. <laughs> he got that story from us. But... Does that make you smart that you was entrusted, you was our producer, and if you did steal some, steal some masters because I entrusted you to, uh, you know, with, with these, with these uh, masters to work, I gave him permission to go to Pacific Archives and all of this, he's my head producer, he was working with us. Do that make you smart or something like that? No, that just makes you a thief. <laughs> Employee, we can all embezzle money or embezzle something from our employers if, if that's what we desire. Mm -hmm. But where he get the story of, of, <laughs> of switching out the, uh, the um, blanks from. As you remember, Daz was out there, I got these Tupac albums. I got, I'm about to come out with a Tupac, uh, Daz Dillinger album and stuff. So we're hearing all of this. So that's when she got this relationship with Maria, where all these allegedly uh, reels are at. So what we, we had Maria do was bring them. She brought them to the studio. But we didn't want her to go home empty-handed. Daz's wife, you're saying, brought all the master tapes to the studio? Yeah, it was like five or six boxes. Like okay. it used to be in the, the yeah. uh, reels, like the old projection, you know. And she brought them to the studio. It was at Trax. Uh, I remember Trax. And we had this guy named Butch Small uh, take, take the reels out and put blanks in there. And so Daz got none but blanks. 
Don't y'all know if Daz had a uh, some Tupac Machiavelli or Tupac, and it, we would have heard it. <laughs> Daz love it. But it would have been all over the internet. I think Daz mentioned he has a song with Biggie that was never released. No, we don't know about that. After Tupac gets killed, Biggie gets killed. Was it about a year later? Six months. Six months later. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and there's lots of stories around that. Correct. From what you understand, do you know anything about about that whole situation? Nothing but what I heard. And like I said, and I always said, and then people said, "Well, Ice, Ice T said it's dry snitching or something like that." When uh, I said that, uh, I believe the story of what murder, murder rap uh, put in their their investigation from murder rap, the Greg Cadence theory. I don't believe what Russell Randall Sullivan is pushing, or the Russell Poole or anything like that. Can you? Can you Put me up to speed? I don't want to speak on it because it, it, it has to do with your, the, the theory of Greg Cadings and a guy by the name of Wardo Fultz Pucci. Aha, right. 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 That's the story, I believe. I had a talk with Greg Cading about this and I have my notes. So according to Greg Cading, uh, Pucci killed Biggie. That's the story, I believe. And Pucci was an associate of Suge? Whatever the story is that Greg is pushing is what I believe. So what is Simon Says Publishing? Simon Says Publishing is a, a publishing music publishing company that I own. Okay. Yes. So there was a rumor you tried to take the publishing from Death Row and transfer it into Simon Says Publishing. Mm, I did buyouts with a lot of people. That was mainly what I did was I bought them out, bought their rights, and um, paid them and, um, from this company called Simon Says Publishing. Okay, so you were buying out people's publishing. Yeah, I was just paying them off, getting paperwork cleared up. Okay. And getting, getting everybody caught up and who, purchased. Who's, who's publishing did you buy? It was pretty much any artist that was, that was still around, that was willing to sell their publishing. Like who? Who was around? Daz was one. <laughs> you Daz, bought Daz's publishing? I bought Daz's publishing. That's why I laughed. I haven't received anything from the Simon Says Publishing because I left it alone uh, after the bankruptcy stuff and after the and I split. Uh, currently, Talking to E1 about it now, but nothing has uh, been, I haven't received a penny from Simon Says Publishing as of yet. Should gets out. Correct. And then the two of you start, you know, not getting along. That's, that's a myth. Sugar and I never had a problem with each other. I just got tired of the feds knocking on my door. I got tired of being questioned. We were going out every night, working crazy nights, and we're still getting in the same stuff that was going to eventually get us back in jail. We were going to clubs, going to the gate, getting into big fights there. Stuff was just happening and I was like, we, we got called in by the uh, ABC, which is Alcohol, Beer, and Tobacco Unit for the LAPD or something. And they banded us from all nightclubs in, in Hollywood. And I was just like, you know what? And that's when I decided, and I went and took a job at this other company called American Music uh, in Downey, where I put out this album with the Relatives and Busy Bone, one of the Bones, uh, Legit Ballers, um, people like that. Well, I guess Suge was accusing you of stealing? That never happened. That's, that, that's, that's, not true. Well, that's not true. Me and Suge been talking up until about a year ago. Me and Suge never had any problems. I eventually went back and started running the company when he went in on a violation. Mm. Uh, so that's that's not okay. that's something that I have heard, yeah. but that's something that Shig and I have never spoke of. What happened to the Rampart Cops? Well, what what people say is is on a, what, when he did the interview with Ice T is he said Reggie know those guys and all these things because they cops. I don't know know no cops, so he assumed that if if the cops had some affiliation or worked for Death Row, those were Reggie people, which these was not. I didn't have any LAPD officers that was working for me. I never met Rafael Perez, David Mack, or any of them before in my life. Don't know who they are. And the investigation that they were under in that Rampart investigation, if they knew me, trust me, they would have told it. <laughs> well, I guess there was an interview with LA Weekly from 2014, and you believe that Suge was trying to get you locked up? Uh, well, I Yes, at that time I believe uh, that he was, cause I, was he in jail at that time or in custody? Possibly. Yeah, 
And so I just believe he was just an angry man that he might have been trying to uh, say or do anything to get himself free. That's okay. probably what I believe. But I since talked to him, and I don't believe that anymore. Okay. So Suge gets into the incident uh, at the, the Straight Outta Compton uh, movie shoot in Tam's parking lot. Okay. Leading up to that, were you and Suge in communication? No. No. I hadn't talked to him probably a couple of years, two or three years. A couple years. years at that point. Yeah. You saw the tape? I saw the tape. Suge goes to the movie set. Story's a bit fuzzy, but I think most people understood that Suge was probably not welcome <laughs> at that movie set considering his relationship with Dre and so forth. Okay. A fight breaks out between him and Bone. Well, well Bone. he left out a lot of things in between. What did I leave out? What happened was, as I understand it, and I spoke to Sugar a couple of times since then, while he was in custody. Uh, not saying he talked about the incident, but I have spoken to him, and this is what I believe happened. Yeah. Is that um, he went to the set, Bones wasn't there, but he talked to Ice Cube and Dre and all of them. They pretty much tell him, hey, Ice Cube, don't worry, Sugar, we're going to get it worked out. We're going to take care of you. Suge was cool. Suge leaves, or was in the process of leaving. Bone, who was hired <laughs> to keep Suge away, or to protect them, because that's pretty much what he does in the industry, mm -hmm. was upset that he wasn't there to deal with it. And so now you know, you're messing up my money. <laughs> that's pretty much what Bone is thinking. It's like, you know, now you got these niggas thinking I'm scared of you, or I wasn't here, or, or whatever. So he calls. Or you have Terry Carter calls and confront and, and say, Suge, hey, I want to meet, meet and talk to you. Suge's by himself, but Suge ain't no punk. Suge ain't scared. I'm like, okay, where y'all want to meet? Where you want to meet? But Suge and Terry Carter are cool, tight. Yeah, Suge, th yeah, that's his friend. That's his friend. That's yeah, his boy. Yeah, that's established. They, they, they good. And so Terry calls him and he goes over there to meet with Bones. Bone. Bones. I don't think they Bones. Cleek, Cleek Sloan, Bones, they call him Bones. Oh, okay, I heard Bones. Okay, that's fine. Go ahead. All right. They go over there to meet with him, and he immediately walked up to the car and started swinging on Shug and hitting him. Shug trying to get away at this time. And I think his anger kicked in to make him drive the second time, and that's when, that's why the video looks so bad. Right, he runs over, well, he runs over Bone. And then hits Terry. Well, he runs over I, both of them. I forget how it went, but I, well, I, no, well, I think yeah, the, he, the he, one he backs really, up. He hits Bone yeah, as he's backing back up. Back I think up. with the with the rearview mirror or something. Bone is on the ground. He then puts it back in drive again, runs over Bone, and then hits Terry and kills him. Yeah. Which I think is what why he didn't have the best of a defense as he can is because of the second time. If he would have kept it in reverse and got out it of just there, took I off. Think it, oh yeah, that would have been yeah. Yeah. Well, nobody would have died. Well, that too. I think, uh, I don't remember. I don't remember but, yeah, but Bone was messed up, but he wasn't, yeah, he wasn't yeah. dead. <laughs> He's yeah. still alive today. So. Yeah, I, I think Terry got hit both times. That's why I'm, I'm No, he didn't get hit both times. It okay. was the second time. No, I, I watched the tape. Okay. Yeah. It was, he, he backed up, hit Bone, then yeah. tried to run. I guess he ran over Bone again and then hit Terry. So Matthew hit twice. Was yeah. Bone. Okay. Yeah, but Bone got hit twice and Terry got hit once. Yeah. Terry dies. Yeah. Unfortunately. Well, Sad for him and the family. And I'll be honest, I had a lot of interviews with people around the situation. I mean, even Big U, okay. I talked to, you know, who's friends with Suge. Oh, yeah, they were real uh, close. Yeah, and I remember Big U said... I think he got about, he was probably going to do about three more calendars, three, four more calendars at the most. Three more years? At the most. And then get out? Yeah, he'd be, he'd be home. He'd definitely be home. I mean, he, he has a, a good shot based on the situation. Yeah, he'd be home. When you look at it. The only thing is, is that he's now on his fifteenth lawyer, and I, I believe he's, he has a public defendant now. It actually works for you. The public is all he really needs. I could see a self-defense, yeah, defense, you know, with, yeah. with with this particular case. But then, lo and behold, a short time after that interview I did with Big U, twenty-eight year plea deal. Yeah. And, and you were talking to Suge in prison during this time. <laughs> I talked to him a year, a year and a half ago. Okay. Spoke to him once after the plea. And what he pretty much explained 
or said was he would have had to win six times to not get life in jail. Win six times? Because there were six different charges? It was three different charges, but he would have had to beat those twice because they would have kept retrying him. Mm. It was the, the alleged threat on the director do, the alleged theft, which Cat Williams had played out to with the, uh, the photographer lady, and then the, the, uh, the hit and run and the attempted murder cases which, like I said, you can try him twice. Right, so, because he already had two strikes. Well, not only because of the strikes. Well, that's why he would have got life. Yeah. And so he would have, instead of getting life, which now he, with my calculation with California law and everything, and the time he did in the L.A. County Jail and stuff, I don't see it, him doing more than 16 years, which would make him 69 years of age, if everything works in his favor. Um, the website says 2037 which would make it like 18 years, is what they're saying, but I don't think he got all this credit yet for, um, uh, for the time he did in county jail. Because in county jail, you get a day for a day. Yeah. So he did three years, seven months in county jail, three years, eight months in county jail. And you multiply that by two, what's that? 7.6. So he's already got credit for seven and, seven and a half years. Oh you, get, oh, you get kind of double time, you get double time in, Oh, really? In county jail. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and from what I was told, you know, I talked to some people who are familiar with the, with the legal system, is that he took, you know, he took the plea deal because if he had gotten any sort of life sentence, and even if it, all was, three. if it was three to life, he knew that he would never get out. Exactly. You have people in jail right now with, on a seven to life deals. Yeah, I heard about seven that. Seven to life. Yeah, I, I know someone who has a friend who got seven to life, and 24 yeah. years later, they're still... Still in custody. Still in custody. Yeah. So, so that was essentially the reason. That's essentially the reason. Now he knows he has a date. He knows plus he has a date. The, plus, you get other freedoms in jail for not being a life prisoner. Oh, okay. You can okay. have conjugal visits. Yeah, okay. Uh, stuff that you can do that well, you don't have an L behind your name that you can't do if you have an L. Shug did an interview, I think, with... Uh, Blast. The blast, yeah. Where he uh, said that he thinks that Dre tried to get him killed. He's talking about at the Chris Brown um, club incident. He was oh, talking, talking about, about oh, he's talking about that he's incident. About, um, oh, where he got shot. When he got shot. Okay. Yeah. Any comment I, about that? I don't believe it's true. He hates Dre. <laughs> Why this man left the company to him? I, I don't know, but I don't know. You know, and I, I've said this before in a lot of interviews. If you take one step back from this whole situation, and you've seen it way more than I have, right? You're, you were right there in the middle of it. But if you just take a step back and you say, okay, if Suge had played his cards a little bit differently, there is a chance that he could be worth like half a billion dollars today. Yeah. That death row would have never broken up. Yeah. He would have a piece of Eminem, Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> you know, well, uh, those artists uh, probably wouldn't have came. You know, I don't know. I think all who those knows? artists worship death row. <laughs> well, who knows if they would have came? Well, you know, yeah. Beats by Dre. Like yeah. what I'm saying is, him and Dre potentially could have still been business partners to this day, as opposed to him. Yeah. You know. Being people thought in jail, he wanted, yeah. People thought know, he wanted the split. He did not. He did not want that split. He didn't want that split. He didn't want Dre push for that split with Jimmy. He didn't want that split. Right. But I also heard that the Dre just did not want. You know, was an artist and did not want to be associated with all the nonsense that was going on at Death Row with all the gang shit and all the violence and everything. He else didn't like that. that. He didn't like that. But like I told you, who was the cause? Michelle Tucson. Michelle, who eventually had a baby by Suge as well. Yes. Once Dre heard and found out about the relationship, I think it hurt him to the core. Even though he was in a relationship with somebody else, but for your business partner to be having a relationship with your baby mama, it hurts. Yeah, and I interviewed Michelle, and you know. She has her opinion. She, has, she, she has her opinion. She has her outlook on things. You know, and, and I guess I remember... Uh, 
during my interview with Daz, he, he showed me this one video where uh, Tupac was in the studio and Michelle A was kind of rubbing up on, on Tupac yeah. as well. And She was affectionate like that. Um, she didn't mean anything by it. But who knows? I don't know. Who knows? But at that time, she was in a relationship with Shep. It's messy. And so she wasn't trying to cross. She, was, she had Dre and Shug at that time. Yeah. Both be, you know. Well, last year, uh, you got indicted. Yes. Is that still going on? Yes. Can you speak on it at all? No. No. Okay. But I, I guess, and you don't, have to, you don't have to talk about it, but your father was indicted as well. Yes. Along with uh, 22 members of the Grape Street Crips and the Peter Roll Mafia and so forth. Correct. You were going through some health problems during that time? Not during that time, a year later. Uh, but th th that was minor. It was, it was this, uh, a disease called achalasia from digest digesting food. That, that's it. It's been fixed and repaired. Okay. So you're better now. I'm, I'm perfect. Is there a trial date set? For this or anything? Oh, no, I played it out. Oh, I, you pleaded out? I played it out. Oh, really? I just haven't been sentenced. Aha. Okay, so you took a plea deal. I took a plea deal. Is this public record or no? I don't even know what the deal is yet. Oh, you don't know what the deal is? No. Okay, did you cooperate in order to get I, that deal? No. I, I just, they have something with the government where pretty much if you just admit your guilt, uh, you know, you don't get as much time as you would have gotten. Okay. That's all I'm doing. Can you say what you admitted to? Oh, uh, sales of marijuana. Marijuana? Marijuana, that's it. That's, that's it. it? That's it, Mar sales of marijuana. That's and, it. That's and we're it. living in a state where marijuana is, is, is legal. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> but the problem is it went across state lines. Aha. Yeah. Okay. Was it a lot of marijuana? What they say? Uh, I mean, that's what they say. That's what they say. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Going to jail over a marijuana <laughs> conviction to, in 2018 it's, it's is a, hard to swallow. It's a hard pill to swallow. It's a hard pill to swallow. Because I think that certain, like for example, in Canada, where they just nationally um, legalize marijuana, yeah. they're going back and I guess reversing a lot it, of the it, charges. It, it, I, I'm hoping and I'm hoping that that eventually would happen, but it's still, you know, a federal law. Okay. Do you have any clue as to what you're facing? Up to five years. Up to five years? Yes. Have you been in jail before? No. This will be your first time? Yes. Do you know when the, uh, the sentencing will happen? No. I mean, I have a date, but um, sometime in December. But it's coming up. Yes. A couple months. Correct. How, how nervous are you right now over that? Oh, it's in the hands of God. That's all I can do. Okay. Being that you are a cop for so long, would they put you in protective custody? Or is there like a unit that's just for police officers? No, no, no. but I'm not sure. I, I don't know any of the, I don't know anything about the federal system at all. Okay. It's a federal case. Yeah, so you potentially might be in general population. It could be. Does that worry you at all? No. No? Well, I'm a man, big boy. <laughs> and you have kids? I do. Uh, how many? Three. How do they feel about it? Uh, everybody's concerned. My family's concerned, but what's going on with your dad? He'd be okay. Did he, he did he plead out as well? No, no, but he, he he he's fighting it. He's going to fight it. And he's I'm assuming, I mean, what in his sixties, seventies? Seventy two. Seventy two. Yeah, my father had no involvement. <laughs> Only thing, uh, well, yeah, is because of me. My, his, his name and my name being the same name is pretty much why he's linked to this. Do you feel bad? Oh, every day. My biggest worry and my biggest regret in life is getting his name tied up into right. something. I mean, it's it's almost like a, like a Bill Cosby situation where, you know, not, I don't mean that, I mean the age. <laughs> the, the age. Yeah, yeah, the I, age I, don't, I don't mean any of the yeah. rape stuff. Yeah, 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 I apologize yeah. for, yeah, even, yeah. you know, for, for no. insinuating that. No, what I'm saying is you have a man who's older, who's lived his life, who's now in retirement age. That's, that's been good and straightforward and played by the rules all his life. Yeah. To even have his name associated uh, to something like that uh, hurts me more than anything. How does he feel about it? He loves his son. Is your mom still alive? 
Yes. How does she feel about it? She's concerned, but they love their son. Yeah. Siblings? Uh, they're a little, they don't love their son as much. <laughs> they don't love their brother. <laughs> they don't as love much their as brother. My parents love their as son. The parents do. So yeah. you, you got cussed out a, a few times? Uh, they don't talk to me like that, but I can feel the distance. But they've yeah. all been very supportive. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. It's, 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 it's a bad situation it's, for, yeah. for that because of that element. Yeah. 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 Well, I hope uh, I hope it works out. It I will. That there's it's a, in the hands of God. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're still you're still fairly you know you're, you're still young. Yeah. You know, people think because you're what forty. No, I'm fifty two. Oh, fifty two. Fifty two. Still young. I'll be alright. You know, when you look at everything that happened with the whole death row story and you know your involvement and everything else like that, what do you think was the biggest mistake? What What do you think that ultimately dragged it all down. Because at this point, you know, death row uh, filed for bankruptcy, right? 2006. At, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. At, one, at one point, death row completely filed for bankruptcy, got bought out by another company. Um, I think people assume that Suge had, you know, hundreds of millions stashed away, but it wasn't true. It, it wasn't true. It wasn't true. You know, because he couldn't even pay his own bail. It wasn't true. You know, so when you look at all that, what do you think really went wrong? If, if you could go back in time well, and, and rewrite certain things. Where they get the bad rap for is Suge was treating people like family instead of business. And what I mean by that is he didn't have a, 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 a royalty department. Suge gets the rap and people think he cheated the amount of money. It's the only reason that people is mad or upset. The people that's mainly talking now, they never put an album out on death row. Let's just keep it fair and be honest. Uh, um, Dre, Tupac, and Snoop. Snoop left with a deal where he got a million dollars and was sold and was, was fine. His, his people and his attorneys looked out on Dre. You know, he walked away from the company. The only reason he has some say so now is because we didn't put in the contracts when he left about digital. And so we didn't know about digital since 95, 96. <laughs> Who knew that that was going to blow up like that? Uh, Tupac, all of that got worked out. Yeah, his mom ended up getting everything she was supposed they to get. got everything. That's worked out. That all right. eventually got worked out. And, and to be fair, like, I had heard stories of Suge's generosity that, that, that wasn't <laughs> that was publicized. My point. You know, like, for example, I think uh, Michelle A. had mentioned when Nate Dogg robbed a Taco Bell. $400,000. Defense, best attorney in Vegas still today, David Chesnaw, was his attorney. Should, should put up 400000 to make sure they Haven't put an album out on death row yet. Yeah. Riding around Lexus S400 the whole time he was on death row. You know, I'd also heard stories of like, I don't know who they who the artists were, but artists would call Suge in the middle of the night and said that my mom's house was going to get foreclosed on. In the morning. Floor. Always get you. If you get a hold to him, you're going to get what you want. <laughs> the problem was getting a hold to him. But if you got a hold of Shug, you caught him at the studio walking in or whatever, and you told him your problem or whatever. But that's, and I understand that now, being 52 years of age, just pay me what I'm deserving. And that's why I said what we messed up at is by not having a royalty department. This is your money, this is what's owed to you. And so people can't grasp what, what, what was they was owed because they didn't see it in black and white. But I'm sure every artist on Death Row got overpaid. Overpaid. Because they're, Danny Boy, another person, he had a $3,500 a month, monthly. When we're talking about in the mid-90s. Living in a, a penthouse in Brentwood. Had a personal assistant driving around in a 500 SL Mercedes Benz. Never put an album out on Death Row. Did you know that Danny Boy was gay? Not at the time. Not at the time. No. Not at the time. Yeah, I did an interview with him where yeah. he talked about it. I'm gay. I have a daughter and two sons. Daughter and two sons. Yeah. Okay. At what point in your life did you realize you were gay? I had, um, I had, I, I, I've experienced some things. Uh, experienced some things when I was younger. Uh, still was loving girls and I, I still love girls. And, um, 
but still dealing with girls. And uh, after I was divorced, I was married for about seven years. And after my divorce, uh, I left. I left our house and I slept in my car for about three weeks and washed up in LA Fitness. And uh, I left the country. I actually went to Amsterdam for a while. When I got back, um, a guy that was pursuing me was really the only person to really open the door. Yeah, not at the time. I think I was the one that exposed him uh, when putting it out when, it, when, when you know, on the internet and YouTube, yeah. which is something I regret. Yeah. Wish I was big enough, but I was getting attacked. <laughs> People were yeah. attacking me, and my only way at the time was to attack, attack back, and that's what I felt was the right thing to do, which now for some yeah. reason I know it's not worth it. Yeah, sometimes you just gotta it's not worth be it. professional and let, let things work out. It's not I, worth it. I, 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 I sense don't apologize, you know, like, yeah. like I said, even Das, I, I said it and talked about it again. I, I hate that I bring it up and talk about it because the young lady is the one that took the heat of it, the beef of it. She got beat up. Daz went home and assaulted her, told her kids, look, I'm going to play this interview for you when they get older because you's a hoe and stuff like that. And she texts me. And you're oh, saying because cause you're saying that Daz's wife had a relationship with Shook. With Shook. And you're, and you're saying that Daz ended up beating her up afterwards? Yeah. After that got exposed and, and was talked about. So I'm saying so, but it didn't hurt. It hurt Daz, but who it hurt more? It hurt her more. Yeah. Uh, you know, the incident with Danny. Then her, Danny, Danny shot me back. He was like, this is a guy I looked up to like an uncle. And why is he worrying about this? Why is he putting this out? Right, I, th I think he has children. Yeah, he had kids. Yeah, he had kids. Yeah, and I'm sure they probably had already knew, but, well, you know. You never know. But that's my point. Yeah, I mean, he was literally, <laughs> like, in our interview, he was literally crying. Yeah. It's a hard lifestyle. It's, it's, not, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. Why is that? Oh. I hate that I exposed that, but you know, he had came on your show saying that me and Michelle ruined the company and did this, but he forgot about the things that had happened that I reminded him, hey, no, that is not how it went down. You went up to the prison, you had access, you went up there and talked to the man. I called and asked you to, to sing at his uncle's funeral, and you tell him you want $10,000. <laughs> I mean, you forgot, did you forget about that? You know, as a business owner, as someone who's, uh, you know, I've been running my company the king, for, uh, for The king years. of this urban stuff on YouTube. You the man, Pat. <laughs> well, I, I, I try to be. Yeah, you the man. I, I, I try to be. No, everybody but, out in this YouTube world, they look up, they trying to be Vlad. Thank you, that's a, yeah. I'll take that. In urban. Yeah. Nervous. Now I'm sure these guys, yeah, these yeah, gamers, yeah. they were like, huh? Yeah, the Who, gamer, yeah. Who's I'm, 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 small, I'm small potatoes <laughs> to, yeah. to, to them. Yeah. But, you know, it takes a long time to learn how to run a company. I think of yeah. all the mistakes I've made oh, man. over the if years. I can rewind things. Uh, you know, and, and it's so complicated between having employees, having office space, having payroll, having human resources, yeah. dealing with the legalities of everything, yeah. dealing with the you know, the laws, having employees in different states and dealing with the different laws yeah. in the different states and, um, you know, trying to do that while still creating, you know, exciting content, <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. you know, not exactly what Death Row was doing, but, you know, we were creating entertainment yeah. for the masses and you're trying to do this. And like said, things that you did five years ago, you wish... Oh, yeah. You, you wish you uh, uh, yeah, I was, I'm a much better boss these yeah. days than, yeah. than, than I used to be when I first started. And, you know, you got a guy like Suge who had never run a company. He didn't go to business school. Um, and also got somewhat drunk with power. I think... It, what we always said and what I always tell him was that article on the New York a magazine when he did uh, the magazine, he was on the front page of New York Magazine, um, which was real big out there. It was with him, Pac, and Snoop. That article, that's when everybody started knowing who he was. And that's when it became Suge Knight and Death Row instead of just Death Row. Right. I mean, because he gets up at the Source Awards and says, if you don't want your CEO all up in the video, 
But here he is on the cover yeah. of the New Yorker, on the cover of the Source. Yeah. Bigger than Death Row in, in certain regards. Yeah. You know and that was his PR guy uh, that did that. And Papa G was the one that put it in his uh, head, the, the Suge Knight, put the Suge Knight out there, yeah. the Suge Knight and Death Row. It wasn't something he thought of or created, but he bought into it. Yeah. And um, he allowed it to happen. And, and to be fair, though, Suge stayed on the bullshit even after Death Row had essentially folded. You know what I'm saying? Still try to do the, you know, I'd heard about the Akon incident where he tried to, you know, collect royalties from a producer that allegedly didn't get paid, and then he gets into this fight with, with Akon's, you know, manager. Yeah. What he got, yeah, you know. Detail. Yeah, the, the, the detail situation that happened, yeah. with, but but Ja was was the dude that I guess yeah. ended up knocking him out. Yeah, you know, there's that situation. He got shot at the Kanye party, which I'd heard yeah. ha- had to do with some bullshit that he was, you know, an altercation that happened beforehand. The Cat Williams situation, you yeah. know, that was caught on tape, punching out the guy at the weed shop. Yeah. Lots of different stories of him pulling out guns on people and, and everything else like that that came from all sorts of different people. Yeah. Like, at the end of the day... But that, that was a broken man then. That was somebody that was, you know, was on top of the world and he was out there scrapping, scrapping for money. Yeah. They had took everything away from him behind a, a judgment that shouldn't have happened. Herio had no right. Herio was paid out, paid out in 96, 97. Well, that, that case was dismissed, but Suge, lack of not having the professional people around him and, and not wanting to deal with stuff professionally is what caused that judgment to happen. And I'm going back to when you asked what happened, the, the, the falls of death row, that's what, I, what it was when he lost to David Kenners to deal with it and not trying to pat myself on the back. Me, who would have made sure we would have dealt with that instead of getting a default judgment? A default judgment is what caused them to have to file bankruptcy. Not that Harry O was correct or the judge, they went through a trial or anything like that. He, it, didn't, he didn't show up to trial. Just didn't show up. This yeah. did, just got a default judgment. Judgment's like, okay, you're not taking my court serious? I'll give you something to make right, you take but, but this Right, but whose fault is that ultimately? I said, it, not it's, his. It's Shook's fault. Yeah, it's his fault. You know what I'm saying? You, yeah. If you don't show up to court, yeah. Yeah. They're just going to take one side of the story exactly. and, and, and run with and that. Run with <laughs> That's how court works. Yeah. This is why yeah. you show up to court. Yeah. And, and you also don't disrespect a judge. Exactly. Oh, yeah. You see what I'm saying? So you could, you know, you could say he's a victim, but ultimately this oh, is... Oh, I'm not putting, putting a halo over his head at all. <laughs> not, at, at, at all. This, this is an adult. And, but, um, I'm saying he didn't... The businesses that he got credit for, he didn't have. He was a creative genius, a marketing genius. Business was not what he was, as far as dealing with that. He always had people that he trusted in those places to deal with that. And then when those people abandoned him and set him aside, and then he started believing the hype, we saw what happened. Yeah, I mean, Daz, went on Instagram and said this is how the death row story ends. Break and bake, y'all. They wonder how the Suge Knight story was going to end. It ended yesterday. 28 years in the penitentiary. He's 53 years old. 28 years. And you wonder how the story of Suge Knight ended. The death row story has ended yesterday. You wonder how life goes and you wonder how life is. And it just ended. You know what I mean? Ha ha! I don't know what to think. Do you know what I'm thinking? Shout out to Suge Knight Jr. Go visit your daddy. He needs you. You hear me? He needs you. He needs you. He needs you, bro. A death row story haven't been told yet. You don't think It'll so? It'll be interesting. I think during his prison stay, he's going to sit down and, um, and really get focused. It's going to take a few years, but then that time we wouldn't, I think if the right person get to him and go and talk to him and interview him and, and start writing and jotting, you might get the, a good yeah. story from him. Because that's where most of my history from pre-95 come from. 
sitting around at that table and just hearing the stories. Yeah. I can tell you his life from, <laughs> from, from yeah. I've, I've always kept my distance from Shelly. Oh, no, I'm not saying, I'm yeah. just saying. Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, I've, and, I've, and I've said this before. I've, I've he's, been not, he's not there yet. Yeah. Anybody yeah. going there in the next year, you're not going to still get the truth or, or get the story from him. Well, because Sugar's always floated the idea that Tupac is still alive. Yeah. He, his, he, his son he, is running with that, which I'm assuming probably But he couldn't shut up. Oh, really? He hasn't been talking lately. Oh, really? So you don't yeah, think that, you don't think that was... Well, they get to the phone, he told him to shut up. Stop that shit, is the exact word. But, but Suge even said that before. He said it, but he throws a smirk. He says, you never know. Whereas his son has full-blown, Tupac's alive, here's the video. Go and see here, October the 30th. <laughs> Go see if you've seen anything like that now. Suge done told him to shut Shug up. told him to... Yeah. Because Tupac's not alive. Tupac's not alive. Tupac's not alive. Well, I just, wish he was. Yeah, everyone wishes that he was. But it's not true. T Tupac's not alive. Yeah. I, I know his friends. Yeah. I know his, his stepbrother. I, I know people that sincerely love him, yeah. who I have personal yeah. off-camera conversations yeah. with. You know, the outlaws went and smoked his ashes afterwards. Yeah, I'm, I'm the one to put that story out <laughs> about the smoking the about ashes. The ashes. I'm the one that had one of my security guys bring the ashes to him. Was kept getting called. When they coming? When the ashes coming? I picked them up from the crematory. And had them flew, you know, from Vegas to LA. Yeah, I know this. I think it was the night of uh, the night of his um had a little memorial for him, you know, with his mom, his family, and shit. And we had hit the beach and um you know threw a lot of shit he liked in the beach, you know, some weeds, some some chicken wings, some you know he loved orange soda, all that some kind of shit. Chicken wings in the ocean. Yeah, yeah, you know he. Pac love that kind of shit. So, you know, we was just giving them our own, you know, um, farewell. And um, that night, um, you know, I forgot which one of us came up with it. You know, they had his ashes and shit. And, uh, you Pac wanna, came up with that shit. If you Pac listen to Black did. Jesus, he said, Last Wishes nigga smoked my ashes. No you doubt. know what I mean? So that was, a, that was a request, you know what I mean, that he had. Now, whether how serious he was about it, <laughs> we took the shit serious. I wasn't yeah. there that night. I ain't. I ain't have a hand in on that. I wasn't there. I, yeah. I ain't know if them was his ashes or whoever ashes. I wasn't there that night. But yeah. that shit went down. Yeah, it went down, man. So you know, we um, you know, I forgot which one of us came up with it. Like we need to go on and do that. But uh, you know, we twist up some of that, some of that great granddaddy California Kush, and mix the big homie with it. You know what I mean? So you know, he flowing through our system. You heard? Yeah, man. Well, listen, uh, Reggie. Uh, Number one, good luck on your sentencing. Thank you. Hopefully, you'll get a minimal, I'm hoping so minimal too. amount of time. You have yeah. kids. Yes. You have a family. Yes. Um, you have a father. Hopefully, your father gets nothing. Yeah. Because at, at seventy yeah. something years old, you don't want. Well, to... Well, not just because of that, because he's innocent. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but I appreciate you you telling the story um, and being transparent about everything. Um, you know, and like I said, you have many years ahead of you. Oh yeah. And a lot more stories to tell. A lot more. Peace. Peace. Appreciate you, Black. No problem.